You're in the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Hi, neighbors. First, I want to remind you that the Paracast is brought to you this week by Audible.com, the Internet's leading provider of audiobooks with more than 85,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. For a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash Paracast. On the Paracast, we're going to explore a subject this week, Chris and I, that we haven't covered too extensively on previous episodes. We'll get to that in a moment. But, of course, we're in the sporting season now. You have the NFL games, the World Series, and everything else. And there's a story that came out from the Huffington Post, believe it or not, which, by the way, is part of AOL now. AOL bought the Huffington Post. Don't get me started about AOL because I have a history with them. Let me just read two paragraphs. For many football fans who watched the New Orleans Saints rout the Indianapolis Colts on October 23rd, the most unusual thing about the game was a lopsided final score of 62-7. to And in retrospect, that's got to be embarrassing to the losing team. But I'm not a big sports buff, especially football. But for UFO aficionados and paranormal experts who, who tuned in, they may have seen something in the sky that was even more out of the ordinary than the tossing of more touchdowns versus incompletions. As NBC's cameras return from a commercial break and focus on the historic, triple-steeped Lewis Cathedral in the city nicknamed the Big Easy, a couple of lit objects seem to streak across the darkening sky, and they've yet to be definitively identified. Did you hear about this? Yeah, those were two phantom passes passed by the missing Peyton Manning. (laughs) <laughs> you're serious yeah hopefully old Peyton's gonna be able to continue his career I mean gosh you know he's got a degenerative nerve condition in his neck it's really sad but boy you can sure tell the team needs him 62 to 7 is that is it was that the score oh my god oh and like I said I'm not a big football person but I understand that now the one thing about this is the UFOs were rod shaped it's one of those mm. rod shaped UFOs yeah so there appears to be Sounds. a story about that we'll have to check the tape on that We've got to see. Certainly the photographic experts in our listening audience should take a look. But isn't it interesting here? It was swamp gas. It was was just swamp gas. I'll drink to that. In fact, I'll drink to anything. But I don't even drink. But this is enough to make you want to drink. But seriously, as we were saying last week when we were talking about the MUFON report that there are more and more UFO sightings, that August showed doubling of the UFO cases from the previous August, that maybe... The media is taking the subject more seriously at long last. Yeah, yeah, one could only hope. It always happens for a brief period of time. Remember also that Huffington Post is still not quite the mainstream media. It's not the New York Times. It's not CNN. It's not Fox News. It's more of a smaller kind of service. But it's interesting that they are actually showing that. Maybe it does show. Well, you wouldn't wouldn't know that they were small by the amount of money that AOL paid for them. Well, that's true. That's true. But you have to think here. AOL, by the way, is a very large news portal. They've Mm -hmm. got one of the largest sets of eyeballs, the largest audiences online of the various news services. So to have a serious story about UFOs and about a UFO film, that is very interesting, regardless of the outcome, because they're also quoting the mutual UFO network there. Let's go back to this very quickly before we get into our main guest. When you went to the MUFON convention in the West Coast, was it? You yeah, it saw the Irvine. mixture of the serious UFOs with the wackadoodle stage. Well, it wasn't as bad as I'm sure it's going to be uh, at some point. I, th- I think these groups, especially the state group, MUFON groups, are really attempting to be all things to all people, and they're trying to attract a, a more diverse audience by having astrologers and numerologists and people that are into the subjects that that we discuss here on the Paracast, but not exclusively UFOs, as their their mission statement says, they're about the scientific investigation of UFOs. And what what does an astrologer have to do with that? I mean, for that matter, the whole abduction and crop circle phenomenon, we don't really have any definitive proof that they're connected to UFOs. So with abductions, though, you have to think, well, if someone says they're being abducted by aliens, there is that connection. Maybe it's not a connection, but it appears to be on the surface. 
Yeah, circumstantially, sure. But, you know, where's the scientific investigation of that? Except for a few dubious claims of artifact removals. Uh, I've never seen, with all these artifacts supposedly being removed from people, these implants or whatever, where's the definitive results, scientific results of testing and determining what these what, what these objects are besides, you know, calcified pieces of foreign matter that somehow worked into a foot or behind a, you know, in the hand or whatever. Um, I, again, I, I don't see a direct link that's been, you know, unequivocally linked to UFOs. So maybe I'm getting crusty and, and more cynical in my old age. But, you know, I, I think getting back to your question, though, uh, there was an amazing turnout uh, there. And then back in February when we had the UFO Congress, I mean, it was standing room only. I remember. So, sure, I was there. Yeah. You know, I think that there is an upsurge of interest in these subjects. And, you know, it kind of does a, a bell curve when you see an upsurge of interest the media takes more notice. That tends to, I guess, suggest to people to look up a little bit more. The more you look up, the more you see. And, and it's, it's almost like a, you know, a self-feeding process. And it ebbs and flows. I mean, when Close Encounters came out, we had uh, you know, an upsurge of, of sightings, uh, for instance. So you know, I think the media has something to do with it in terms of popular movies that come out. Well, the other several... thing, it's called the publicity flap, I guess, where yeah. you have coverage of UFO events. So people may look to the skies and see more things, or they were holding in the details of their sightings, but they see other people reporting those sightings, so they feel more or less constrained. Rather than being constrained not to report them, they feel encouraged to talk about them. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, certainly it's one thing that's happening. So we have a publicity flap, and that's why it's so difficult to gauge the occurrence of UFO activity. Because as long as there's an unknown number of people out there who will never report their sightings, we have no way of knowing how many there yeah. really are. Exactly. I've often heard the, the figure one out of ten sightings are reported, bannered about. But, you know, we, we really don't know. And it's, uh, it's interesting when, like, for instance, Peter <laughs> Davenport, uh, I love this. He, uh, I don't think he'd ever seen a UFO before, to my knowledge. And all of a sudden, even the head of the... National UFO Reporting Center is reporting a UFO. So maybe maybe we are in the midst of a little mini flap and we're not even, you know, we're not aware of it. Maybe the UFO knots are trying to catch us up, you know, saying, hey, all these UFO researchers are running around saying they never saw anything. We're going to change that. You never know. You know, one subject that we haven't covered as much as maybe you expect on the show is ancient astronauts. We've had a few shows about it. We tried early on to bring on an ancient astronaut expert. I remember back in the old days, 2006, 2007, of the PowerCast, you think five years ago was the old days, where we invited a guy named Jason Martell, is it? And he disappeared. We were ready to record, and he disappeared. So what happened to him? I don't know. He just never responded. We were ready to talk to him on Skype. We had his Skype name and everything, and never showed up, never responded to email. Of course, maybe it was because... The PowerCast had a reputation, then is now, that we're not going to just give guests a pass. We're going to ask hard questions. Yeah. We'll bring on people that other shows will interview and just sort of softball the questions, and we'll ask them things they didn't expect to be asked, and we'll sit back and wait for the answers. <laughs> yes, we'll that's bring right. our own tricks that's not my trick. No, that's not my trickster voice. That's my demonic voice. <laughs> The Shadow Knows. Yes. Well, we have coming to us from his residence in the UK, Philip Coppins, and the book is called I The in, An Actually, I think he's in Belgium, isn't he? Well, he's in the UK now. Oh, okay. All right. But he has a book out called The Ancient Alien Question, and Eric Von Daniken wrote the introduction. Yep. So hey, I see that ancient alien in the, in the title. Boy, that's... Uh... That's that a pretty hot uh, buzz term here lately in the United States, so pretty smart titling. And one more thing. If you have a comment or a question, write us, news at com. Once again, neighbors, that's news at com. Philip Coppins, coming up next on The Paracast. <laughs> So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. 
the site went down. It just stopped responding. It took hours before it returned, but I had already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Check it out. iWeb.com. That's iWeb.com. Are you wondering about your retirement portfolio? Are you confident that the financial advisor is experienced enough to combat climbing interest rates, taxes, and inflation? Stop guessing and go to the expert, Robert Chapman of the International Forecaster. When you subscribe to the International Forecaster, you get Robert Chapman's 45 years of experience and concise investment recommendations. Who needs sugar-coated excuses when you can get the cold hard facts and proven investment leads you can't get anywhere else? For a free introductory copy to Robert Chapman's International Forecaster, subscribe now at theinternationalforecaster.com or call 877-479-8178. Experience the difference. When you subscribe, you can email Robert Chapman directly to obtain investment advice tailored just for you. Don't wait another minute. Subscribe today at the internationalforecaster.com or call 877-479-8178. That's 877-479-8178. For centuries, silver has been used as a powerful natural antibiotic. And as a listener to this station, you probably already know the benefits of using colloidal silver. With so many websites to choose from, finding a reputable patriotic company with great products at affordable prices can be a difficult task. Introducing UtopiaSilver.com. UtopiaSilver.com carries the best, most effective, and most affordable colloidal silver and colloidal gold products in the industry. UtopiaSilver.com also carries products to fit your lifestyle, including weight loss, immune system defense, cleanses, herbs, joint and bone care, and much more. First-time customers using promo code GCN50 will receive 50% off all colloidal products. Visit us today at Utopia Silver. That's U-T-O-P-I-A Silver. UtopiaSilver.com or call 888-213-4338. That's 888-213-4338. UtopiaSilver.com. Taking back America's health care one American at a time. Survival of the fittest. In any and all situations, survival is your number one priority. That requires being tough and thinking smart. And the folks at Freeze Dry Guy are going to help you do just that. They have a long range patrol ration entrees, what they call the Brick Pack. When you're in survival mode, it is absolutely the best item for your survival pack or bug out bag. You can go farther, faster, and carry more food with the LRP cold weather ration entrees. Not only do these long-lasting, durable entrees help sustain you or your family through the harshest environment or situation, they are by far the most delicious of their kind. No contest. With a variety of tasty entrees, you can't beat the LRP Brick Packs. Let Freeze Dry Guy help you in your survival situations. Go to freezedryguy.com. That's freezedryguy.com. Or call 866-404-3663. That's 866-404-FOOD. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And if you'd like to catch up on past episodes, we have hundreds of shows for you to download direct from theparacast.com. That's theparacast.com. Or check us out at iTunes. We explore the amazing mystery of ancient astronauts. Now, I first read about the legends of E.T. possibly visiting us in thousands of years ago. In a source, an unlikely source, I don't know whether our guest Philip Coppins knows about this particular source, but the book Flying Saucers Have Landed by Desmond Leslie and George Adamski. We all think of George Adamski talking of meeting E.T. in the desert, the California desert in 1952. But the first part from Desmond Leslie was about ancient astronauts. And then later on, there was a series of articles called Extraterrestrialism as an Historical Doctrine by someone named Yona Fortner, also in the 1950s, talking about legends of E.T. in ancient times. 
Philip, did you ever hear of either of those people, Yona Fortner or Desmond Leslie? Well, actually, uh, the first one, Yona Fortner, I haven't, but Desmond Leslie, uh, yes, I am uh, very familiar with him as well as, of course, George Adamski. Okay, let's kind of start with your background. Are you basically a writer, researcher? How did you get attracted to exploring these mysteries? I'm in background of an investigative journalist. And most of what I did involved really hard political, quite often intelligence agencies, kind of bringing stories to the world, which you wouldn't find without doing some investigation, hence why they're called investigative journalists, I guess. In the early 1990s, I came across a story which I wanted to dig deeper because I felt that there was more of a story there. And basically, this was in the run-up to the Kennedy assassination's 30th anniversary. And the story involved um, Lee Harvey Oswald, the alleged assassin of Kennedy, Lee Harvey Oswald. And he had come from Russia a few years before. And while he was in Rotterdam waiting to, to go to New York, there were certain incidents there which I felt uh, needed to be some more digging. And in the end, actually, some of that material, which I, I dug up, was used in a congressional committee to question whether or not they should reopen another investigation into the Kennedy assassination. And at that moment in time, there were still things like news clipping services. And one of the news clipping services which were coming in involved a story or the claim of a guy called Bill Cooper, who basically said that Kennedy's limo driver in Dallas had turned around, had shot Kennedy in the face with a gun, then turned around again, continued driving. And the reason why this had happened was because Kennedy was about to spill the beans on the existence of extraterrestrials on planet Earth and things like Roswell and various other things. Obviously, you know, I'd heard of UFOs, but I would by no stretch of the imagination call myself to be a, an expert, let alone knowledgeable. So I began to delve into that library books, which were available. And one of the first ones was actually Billy Meyer and his story. So I kind of like began to look into that, realized that there wasn't really too much going for these stories. But oh, I certainly think that Cooper is something largely dismissed. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, the story that somehow the limo driver was able to turn himself around to, to shoot Kennedy was absolutely impossible. And don't uh, get us started about Billy Meyer, please. Well, actually, maybe I would. <laughs> but, you know, in, in the near the, the time which came there, I, I basically was asked by a publisher to stop being an investigative journalist and, and come and work for them. And amongst the several books they did were two which they wanted my help on with promotion to the English language. And one of them involved uh, the megalithic civilization. And the second one was a book on the mystery of Rennes Chateau. There I was, I was digging into those, delving into those, studying about ancient civilizations. Basically, to cut a long story short, less than two years later, I became uh, the founding member, founding director, editor-in-chief of a Dutch newsstand magazine called Frontier Magazine. At that moment in time, we called it Frontier 2000, which was all about um, esoteric alternative history and topics, um, UFOs, crop circles, all of those things. Even though I'm no longer directly involved with the magazine, Magazine. I'm very proud that a few months ago, we actually celebrated our 100 issues. So that, in a somewhat long story, is a almost 20-year-long adventure in the alternative. Okay, let's talk about the adventure of the ancient astronauts. How did you begin to cover this? Did you check the books? Did you do some on-site research? What did you do? The very first exposure was actually to, again, to what I was doing. And it was a story of a German tour operator, Hartwig Hausdorff, who had identified, who had proven that there were indeed pyramids in China. There had been rumors about, but nobody had really come up with, with real evidence. And in 1994, the Soviet bloc had, had basically just crumbled. He had been allowed access to go into China, and, and he basically reported on the fact that he had seen the Chinese pyramids themselves, and he had taken photographs, and he had speak, spoken to people who had been involved with his scientific research. He was publishing in German, and I wanted him to help get this story out in English. And so this was pretty much what I was doing. And in fact, once Frontier became a, a, a publisher, one of my mission statements has always been to help people who are either challenged through no fault of their own, but sometimes simply through a language barrier to get the 
message out to a larger audience. So early on, it was very much just reporting and basically, you know, fact checking that what they were reporting was accurate, telling, you know, like certain things, reporting on stories which were out there. And then it's like one day, probably without realizing it, you also become an investigator. You you go off on um, subjects which you feel nobody else is looking into. And you're beginning to do your own research. You know, as I've always been, would consider myself to to be still an investigative journalist. That is still something which which I do today. I just I'm confronted with things and investigate them. Now, as an investigative journalist, to whom did you send your stories? Where were you published? Originally, they were published, um, obviously, in my own Dutch magazine. Um, Nexus has always been a, a very early supporter of mine. And, you know, in, in the decades now since since I have been doing this, I've pretty much, I think, been published in every single magazine or type of publication there is. New Dawn comes to mind, Atlantis Rising, Nexus comes to mind. Fortune Times, I have had articles in Italian magazines. To, to some extent, these days, uh, I quite often find myself being translated uh, in, in magazines or, or on websites and have absolutely no knowledge um, of them ever asking me to run a translation of an article. But yes, it, it has uh, definitely been a quite a wide range of, of publications which have taken my articles since. What attracted you to the subject of possible ET visitations? Did you ever see a UFO? Um, I have never seen a UFO. Um, and, and maybe that's an attraction in itself. Um, but, but basically, it, it was the fact that there, you know, when I started looking into the libraries, trying to find up, trying to find evidence, and trying to find books um, on, on on certain things, uh, the, the books of von Danik and the books of, of other people uh, were always there and were always consultable. Um, and what um, I recognized in the work of von Danik was, even though he doesn't have the background of an investigative journalist, his books are very much uh, written from the perspective of an investigative journalist. People always say that von Däniken comes with theories, but that's not the case. Um, you know, von Däniken analyzes certain bits of evidence and then asks questions and sometimes will say, okay, this is, uh, in my opinion, evidence of, of an alien visitation. But he will never go into details as to kind of like say how he lived there, uh, when exactly he came, from which planet he comes. That's more the bailiwick of the likes of a William Bramley uh, and very specifically of the likes of Zachariah Sitchin and to some extent of Robert Temple. We'll get into so, more of that with a moment. Philip Coppins joins us. Ancient astronauts are on the table. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in the Paracast. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. Hey folks, in today's fast-paced work environment, getting everyone in the same room for a meeting can be challenging, especially when they work in different locations. And that's why I use GoToMeeting with HD Faces by Citrix. It is amazing. You can collaborate online by sharing your presentation. While seeing colleagues face-to-face -face in high definition, they can hide their blemishes. Video quality is so clear and natural, it's like being in the same room. And all you need is an internet connection with a webcam. It's that easy. So here's what I can do. For example, on the Paracast, which I host with my friend Chris O'Brien, we live in different locations. We need to share something, a document or something like that. All I have to do is call him up with GoToMeeting, and I say, Chris, take a look at this, and he said he's ready to go. You can try GoToMeeting with HD Faces free for 30 days. Visit GoToMeeting.com, click the Try It Free button, enter the promo code PODCAST, use the promo code PODCAST. Hi, I'm Mark Craighead, founder of Crossbreed Holsters. I designed our top-selling holster, the Super Tuck Deluxe, to solve the problems of being poked, pinched, and gouged while carrying concealed. The Super Tuck Deluxe is the most comfortable, most concealable holster on the market today. We offer a two-week free trial and a lifetime warranty. Visit us at CrossbreedHolsters.com. Don't forget, CrossbreedHolsters.com. That's the sound of your door being kicked in by an intruder with a single kick. 
That's the sound of the same door now protected by the Door Sentinel at MySafeDoor.com. Go to MySafeDoor.com right now and watch the amazing video. At MySafeDoor.com, you'll learn how to turn your home into a fortress with the Door Sentinel. 16 kicks later, and the Door Sentinel is still holding strong. MySafeDoor.com. That's MySafeDoor.com. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over six years and serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey Guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light Systems system today complete with two black berkey elements for only 231 dollars and the berkey guy will ship your order free of charge with the purchase of a berkey light the berkey guy is also offering a set of fluoride and arsenic filters for only 39.99 that's over 30 percent off the retail price call the berkey guy at 1-877-886-3653 that's 1-877-886-3653 or order online at goberkey.com that's goberkey.com today What nutrition are you missing that's leading to the four major diseases? Cancer, arthritis, heart disease, and Parkinson's. There are at least 80,000 medical studies that show a lack of the protein glutathione to be linked to cancer, heart disease, Parkinson's, macular degeneration, lung disease, digestive diseases, diabetes, Alzheimer's, ALS, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus. In all, at least 68 diseases. What is the number one food by which your body is most empowered to increase its glutathione production? It is undamaged whey protein from grass-fed cows. One World Whey is truly the first undamaged whey protein. All other whey protein powders are damaged by heat, chemicals, and filtration. One World Whey is the most life-giving whey protein powder ever produced. Call 888-988-3325. That's 888-988-3325. Or visit OneWorldWay.com. That's OneWorldWhey.com. Hi, this is Don Ecker, and you are tuned into the Paracast. Let me tell you what, you're going to hear stuff here that you probably won't hear anywhere else. Hear that, George Snorri? With Philip Coppins, we are exploring E.T., not necessarily today, but a long, long time ago, in the same galaxy, in the same reality. We've seen these books, especially Von Daniken. He wrote the forward to your book, so obviously you do accept what he does. But let's look at the research. Did you go back to try to look at the raw research to see where they were coming from? Yes. My book is not so much just all kind of like, you know, trying to get all the evidence which ever anybody has written on, on anything. I go for trying to make a case for the fact that we have been um, visited and the possibility that we have been visited and, and creating a framework for this. So um, it's, it's not an encyclopedic work, nor could it ever be an encyclopedic work. But I did look at the best available evidence, and I also obviously brought in some of my own research, which I have done over the years, um, some of it which has been published, some of it which hasn't, and basically show that Sometimes people are right and sometimes people are wrong and sometimes people um, have gotten it half right and half wrong. Some of the things which people will swear by, I I will not swear by. Um, some of the things which other people have rejected, um, I actually felt that I had to resurrect. And one of the things which I feel um, people have discarded way too quickly um, is the story of the Chinese Roswell. In short, this is a story which came about, uh, people think, around the 1980s when people were reporting on the so-called stone discs of Bayan Karaula. Would now, you explain what that means in more detail? Yes, the stone discs of Bayan Karaula is the story about stone discs which have been found in a remote part of China. Uh, The story goes that they were discovered in the 1910s or the 1920s by people um, basically on an expedition there. And that in 1962, a Chinese professor was able to decode inscriptions on these disks. And that these inscriptions basically said 
that the people who were lying next, the, the corpses of the people who were lying next, or the bones, the fragments of bones of the people who were lying next to these discs, were people who had, in the very remote past, crashed on planet Earth in a spacecraft that two such crashes had occurred over a number of thousands of years and that, um, at least in one instance, the, the survivors of this crash began to um, intermingle with the local people. Why I say that this story has been um, removed too, too quickly from uh, evidence of, of potential ancient alien visitation is that in 1978, a book appeared which was called Sun Gods in Exile and the person writing it um, pretended as if this story, as if his book was nonfiction. And a number of years later, he said, well, you know, I pretended it was nonfiction, but it is fiction. And this story um, talks about this exploration, about the stone discs of Bayan Kara Ula. And so you have people who say, well, you see, you know, like, oh, we were, t- we were taken in, it's now all been discredited. Well, that is absolutely simply not the case. The earliest references to this story in the Western media go back to 1962. There is, you know, evidence of of newspaper clippings from Germany that this story appeared in the German press in 1962. And probably the reason why it appeared in 1962 is because the story goes that in China in 1962, somebody made this discovery. Now, all of this work is done by amateur archaeologists, amateur historians, because scientists have said that they know just as with the UFO thing and so many other things, including uh, life after death or, you know, name it, um, that there is no evidence whatsoever uh, that these things can be true because they just know. Um, And so no scientist has has really had the time or the effort or taken the effort to go there to China and and discover more. But we know that it is not uh, a hoax dating from 1978. There were newspaper reports everywhere in 1962 saying that, you know, this decipherment had occurred. Now, could it be Chinese propaganda? Maybe. But there were news reports in 1962. Now, the possibility, if not the likelihood, that this isn't Chinese propaganda is what happened in uh, relatively recent times. In 1997, the Chinese government wanted to have a census because at this moment in time, there are 1.3 billion Chinese. I do not know how many there were uh, a decade ago, but there were an awful lot. And the Chinese government wanted to know how many precisely and how they, they were structured in groups and tribes and where they were living. And so one day they come across a tribe which to them forms an enigma. They are very thick skulled. They have pretty much deeply inset eyes and they look weird. And so the scientists try to explain this and they basically say that they think that they look so weird because of lead poisoning or some other kind of thing. And internally, these conclusions are contested because basically lead poisoning kills. It doesn't cause a genetic mutation. Um, And so the Chinese scientists in charge of this investigation have to conclude that they have no uh, known origins as to why these people would look so weird. Well, guess where these people have been found? These people have been found in the very region where the stone disks of Bayan Karaula were found. Um, We know that people in the past... Um, you know, were believed to have been intermarried um, with these creatures from elsewhere. And so that we find in that very region, bizarre looking um, creatures um, actually adds extra weight to it. Now, once again, we need to have scientists who are willing to look at this because the area we're in right now involves DNA research. And all of these things are simply incapable of being done without the help of science. Let me ask you you a fast question, Philip, before we go on. Have you actually tried to make an effort to go to these places on site directly to see what's going on? The person uh, who is trying to do that at this moment in time is a guy called Hartwig Hausdorf. And basically he has a track record of trying to get far more done with the Chinese authorities than I ever will. Um, Fifteen years into trying, he has still not gotten uh, the proper authorization forms to go there. They don't want to allow this? Um, as all, as as with so many things, you know, the, the first question will, like the first question he is asked is, why are, do you want to speak to these people? Um, you either lie, <laughs> or you tell the truth. And when you tell the truth as to why you want to speak to these people, guess what? Authorities are less inclined to give you permits because they know trouble will come by default. The these questions will lead to trouble. One thing I want to mention is the the, 
fairly obscure photograph that I've seen um, just in a couple of places of two uh, what appear to be alien-looking humans that are said to be the last real remaining, I, I think, full-blood uh, versions of these these supposed uh, visitors that are, were shipwrecked in China uh, several thousand years ago. Uh, are you familiar with that photograph? They're sitting, uh, it's a male and female sitting side by side, and they're, if they're you know, five feet tall, I'd be really surprised. Very, very short. Yes, and, the photograph, uh, real, the photo, sorry, the photograph is reproduced in my book. Yeah, yeah, and I, I wanted to mention that, that it's, it's a pretty rare uh, photograph, but just looking at those two individuals, it, it kind of makes you wonder. Absolutely. You know, as I said, the photograph is reproduced in my book, and it's one of those things whereby um, it becomes clear um, that something quite interesting is, is going on here. Um, again, this isn't speculation. These people clearly look weird. Uh, the reason why they look weird is there has to be an explanation for this. Now, you know, you might say that there are more mundane reasons as to why this might be the case, and maybe one day we will indeed find out that this is the case. But we need to explore. And right now, the best available evidence does suggest that we should take them on their word, which is that they are saying that they are from basically mixed alien blood. So unless we can, you know, unless science can disprove that, to me, in all logic, uh, this is what we should be going for. These well, you can claim... take a DNA test, though, to determine that. Well, yes, but again, this is, this is requiring science to cooperate. Science <laughs> well, that's always a big deal. Isn't that also the biggest issue with regard to nailing these theories and mysteries down is to getting traditional science to do the real research, not just dismiss it out of hand. Do the research. As I said, do the DNA test. See if there's something there that indicates there's something unknown about this. We have Philip Coppins. The book is The Ancient Alien Question. If you have a comment or a question, write us, news at theparacast.com. Once again, neighbors, that's news at theparacast.com. We'll have lots more with Gene and Chris. You're in The Paracast. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. Are you ready to order the official Paracast t-shirt? You asked, we answered. We're now taking orders for the official Paracast t-shirt. It comes in white, 100% cotton. The front of it features the same logo that we have on our community forums. On the back it says, separating signal from noise. To order the official Paracast t-shirt, here's all you have to do. Visit our new online store at store.theparacast.com. One more time, that's store.theparacast.com. You can use a major credit card to place your order for the official Paracast t-shirt. Hey, neighbors, we have one more thing to talk about, and that's more merchandise at the official Paracast store. We have hats, we have jackets, we even have a flip video camcorder customized with the Paracast logo at the official Paracast store. It's all now available at the official Paracast store, store store.theparacast.com. What happened, man? You used to be energetic, happy, and wow, did the ladies love you. Now, you fall asleep on the couch, irritable, and out of shape. Don't be that guy. Call now for a risk-free trial of Ageless Male, a natural supplement shown to raise testosterone by 50% and maintain healthy, normal levels. No injections, no appointments. With healthy testosterone levels, you can feel that energy again, that great outlook again, and yes, even a healthy sex drive. Right now, you can try Ageless Male risk-free. There's nothing to lose, guys. If you're a man who's noticed changes in your body, your mood, your sex life, call now for a risk-free trial of Ageless Male. Be the guy you used to be. Just call 1-888-246-0623. Don't wait another day. Just call 1-888-246-0623. Again, 1-888-246-0623. Jason Lewis here with the holidays just around the corner. Be sure to consider the greatest gift you can give to your friends and family. 
peace of mind. That's why I choose WiseFoodStorage.com. WiseFoodStorage.com offers delicious ready-made meals like cheesy lasagna, savory stroganoff, and pasta alfredo that are packaged for freshness in individual metal mylar pouches and carry a 25-year shelf life. And they're ready to eat in minutes. Simply add hot water. Request a free entree sample today at WiseFoodStorage.com. And for a limited time, get free shipping and 10% off of your order. That's right, a free entree, free shipping, and 10% off any order. Just use promo code LEWIS. Call 855-FOODWISE. That's 855-366-3947. Or visit WiseFoodStorage.com. That's WISE, W-I-S-E, FoodStorage.com. Gourmet emergency food at the best price and the greatest gift you can give to the ones you love this holiday season. You can't argue with success, and many people have found great success in fighting back colds and flu viruses with Ali C, the world's best garlic extract. So now, it's time to get even more success with the other great quality natural products from Affinity Health Products, like C Energy Liquid Vitamins, Lose and Snooze, and the One Day Diet, or Human Growth Hormone Support menopause specialist for women and joint specialist see these and many other quality affinity health products for men and women online at affinityhealthproducts.com that's a-f-f-i-n-i-t-y healthproducts.com or call in your orders at 877-888-7126 that's 1-877-888-7126 trust your health to the makers of ali c the world's best garlic extract Affinity Health Products, the finest and most innovative natural health products available. This is Leslie Kane, and I'm with the Coalition for Freedom of Information, and you are listening to the Paracast. Philip Coppins is our guest, Ancient Astronauts on the Table with Gina and Chris on the Paracast, and we're exploring how to take these mysteries, these legends, and see what's going on. And as you see in the question I raised before we retreated for a couple of seconds there, how do we get mainstream science to do the DNA testing and all the other stuff to prove whether this is the case, that ancient astronauts came here, whether they interbreeded with earthlings, etc.? It's a big question, and you know I don't think it has an it has an easy answer. Um, the reluctance of science to engage in anything, um, again, whether it is evidence of of near death experiences, whether it are anomalous um, archaeological finds which have nothing to do with ancient aliens, but just with maybe lost civilizations or unknown dimensions of a known civilization. All of these things science isn't willing to address. Uh, in the case when it comes to uh, near-death experiences, they pretend that it's not their bailiwick, that this is not something science should be doing. Um, the question is, you know, whose bailiwick is it then? Um, and again, when it comes to archaeology, um, archaeologists basically say that they know that this is impossible, so they don't feel a need to do this. And right now there is nobody out there who is, is in essence able to tell them that they have to do this. Um, however, what I do think is happening, um, and to some extent you know, the popularity of ancient aliens is, is showing this, is that people are beginning to realize that science is unwilling to address certain things. And also that there is a populist or a popular movement of people who are basically, I think, in the not too distant future are going to demand from scientists um, that if they are continuing to get our money, then that this should also be trying to answer questions which we, the people, um, want to see answered. Because in in this day and age, so much attention is being given to uh, Wall Street, to politicians. But academics are getting off lightly, and all the ills of uh, Wall Street and of um, politics are also apparent and present in um, science. So far, it's not risen to the surface and it's not displayed on on, on front pages only when it has clear political implications like global warming and climate uh, scientists. Do you find that the controversy um, and some of the the ills and the woes of of science do make it to the front page news? Uh, Climate Gate, which struck the UK a few years ago, is probably the best example of this. But apart from those areas of, of science, they are getting an extremely 
easy ride. And I think this is going to change. I think they are going to be held more accountable, specifically if they are thinking of, of getting public money to, to basically do their research. Well, the, you bring up a really good point, Philip. And, I, and before we get too far away from the Dropa stones in China, um, here's, here's a classic example of, of science kind of muddying the waters and kind of sticking their, their f- <laughs> something in the ears to stop progress. One of the things that I remember reading some time back, and I, I don't think you really address it in your book, is the, is the actual uh, whereabouts of these stones. The, at some point, I think in the early 60s, well, I think it was in the 30s and then the 60s, weren't they? They're like giant records, and they were trying to decipher them. Now, to my understanding, didn't the Russians actually end up with those stones, or are they back in the possession of the Chinese? Uh, well, the, the, the buy disks, um, which the Chinese professor um, analyzed, we don't know um, where they were precisely. In 1974, uh, it might have been 1972, uh, a, a German tourist photographed two buy disks in a museum in China. And he was told by his guides that these were the very buy disks involved with the saga of Bayan Karaula. Now, this is unknown whether you know, the guide was right or not. Uh, what Hausdorff was able to show in the 1990s that these buy discs had been taken from public exhibition uh, and were now somewhere uh, in the back of the museum. And when he asked to see them, um, basically it took a while and he has not been able uh, to photograph them. Um, so there is some confusion as to where the original buy discs are. Buy discs as such are very common. Pretty much everybody uh, in China was buried with these bi- with buy discs. Uh, the the sp- specific nature of these buy discs, you know, which which form part of uh, the Bayan Karaula saga, is that these buy discs contained inscriptions which nobody could um, analyze or translate until uh, the 1960s, when somebody did manage to apparently do so, and when he did so, uh, came up with this story about how they showed that the people who were there um, were of, of mixed uh, extraterrestrial origin. Yeah, well, again, you know, science has an obligation, I think, to humanity to come up with some definitive answers, and of course, until we get public uh, a public uh, upwelling of, of support for this type of process, they're just going to continue, uh, you know, keeping it in the closet. And uh, if they avert their eyes, it doesn't exist, sort of, you know, the ostrich and head in the sand sort of routine, which is unfortunate. Well, I mean, it's, and it's, it's remarkable. You know, what's, what people, I think, know but don't realize is the following. There are currently, and there have been for decades, if, if not more than a century, archaeological excavations going on across the world. Archaeological ex- excavations of, you know, which are non-controversial. They are just excavating. The people, the archaeologists involved, quite often wait years, sometimes decades, before being published before they really decide that they feel they're in a position to to write about this. The Italian archaeologists have made an analysis. 80% of material from archaeological excavations in Italy has never been published. This means that there is no trace at all of these artifacts. They are just lying somewhere um, as complete unknowns. And guess what? An awful lot of them go missing because after a while... These vaults of museums fill up. People, you know, come in and they say, well, what is, what is this stone about? And they kind of go, oh, we don't know. Nobody's ever published anything about this. Oh, how long has it been here? Oh, 70 years? Oh, pff, let's ditch it. We don't need it. Um, and so – That would look know, like, great on my mantle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, it's Christmas. I, I could have... use that as a paperweight. Uh huh. It's Christmas. I have forgotten to give a, a present to my son. Here is one. Um, and, you know, all of these things um, are happening day in, day out. And, and this is about the non-controversial bits. So all of this evidence, you know, doesn't exist um, because there is no documentation of this. Um, and, and, and this is, is again, underlining the problem um, which archaeology ha- has as a whole. And, and one of the reasons why the ancient alien question, you know, the title of my book is The Ancient Alien Question. I would have much preferred it to have called The Ancient Alien Answer, but I do not have billions of dollars. 
And because right. I do not have billions of dollars, I, I cannot employ universities to do my bidding for me and basically give me answers. I rely still on scientists to give me the answers, or at least some of the right. answers. Well, one of the things that I really was uh, quite fascinated by in your book is the very, very thorough way that you went through many of our you know, very, very interesting and, and controversial archaeological sites. Of course, we all remember Eric von Donneken's Chariot of the Gods and uh, Gold of the Gods and, and some of his early books, where he did you know, a, a fair job for the time of looking at some of these megalithic sites, for instance, uh, and, and other sites around the world that – that scientists really have never really reconciled some of the details of how these sites were constructed, what they were used for. And one thing that I do uh, appreciate from your book is, is you do a very good job of going through some of these sites and really explaining what we know now. It's been 40 years since some of Von Donnegan's earliest studies came out, and some of them have been refuted. Others still are, are controversial and subject to, uh, to question. Which of the megalithic sites... Uh, do you feel offer the best evidence of some form of interaction with uh, extraterrestrials? Um, I would say Baalbek, uh, simply because of its sheer size. Um, a very close second is Pumapunku, and I'll probably begin with Pumapunku to explain why I prefer Baalbek. Um, Pumapunku is the site on the uh, Bolivian Altiplano, very close to Tijuanaco. And it shows extraordinary designs. It shows evidence of extraordinary detailed drilling, um, which either somebody did with extraordinary eye for detail um, or a, a tool which you know, would be described as a pretty much high technolog no, technological tool. It's also the designs there are of an intricacy whereby you go, why would anybody need – to have this kind of detail. It looks as if it was made um, for you know, a, a, a technological application, a technological machinery to be hooked up to this installation. Now, is that, I'm going to ask you a quick question, the devil's advocate's question, but you'll have to wait till our next segment to answer. I'm not trying to be nasty, it's just my way. And that is here, how do we know this isn't one of these one-off things that somebody built a model of something and it may have some kind of artistic merit, but had no technological value. And we'll explain why I said that in a moment. We have Philip Coppins with Gene and Chris. So you're definitely in the Paracast. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you own an Apple iPhone and love to listen to your favorite programs on GCN, I've got good news for you. I'm proud to announce that GCN has a brand new iPhone app available for our dedicated listeners at GCNlive.com. Listen to your favorite hard-hitting GCN programs live or on demand right on your iPhone. And the best part? The GCN iPhone app can be yours absolutely free. Download the iPhone app today by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, and Investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs. They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. With Philip Coppins talking ancient astronauts and other stuff with Gene and Chris in the Paracast. So the question I raised, kind of a devil's advocate look here. When you find these strange artifacts like something that looked like a little tiny primitive helicopter, like a toy some years back. Could these be just toys, something someone imagines rather than something real? Um parts. <laughs> well, precisely, and this is the reason why um, you know, Puma Punky is up there very highly. Now, 
again, Puma Punku, if it was a one-off without any need, just kind of like a guy doing it, then first of all, he was extremely devoted. Um, he was also allowed to do so on sacred ground. And, and third of all, he did have uh, technological tools at his uh, disposal to do so. So it's not just that, that this was a guy freewheeling in his garage somewhere uh, in, in the back lot of, of an unknown, uh, you know, boring suburban kind of, pre, in, of prehistory. But with Baalbek, this changes. With Baalbek, you cannot go for the, for the easy answers. Baalbek incorporates stones which weigh up to two tons. There are stones there, um, you know, several of them, which are over one ton. Um, these stones but, but, uh, now wait a minute they're two hundred tons I think no. the, the the trilithalon is is how big is the tri- trilithalon there are stones in the platform which are up to one thousand two hundred tons, and there is one in the quarry which is is basically nineteen hundred tons. What we have is is stones of of enormous weight. The question is how did these get transported uh they were they clearly were, and at the end of the twentieth century. Basically, there was no technology in place which could transport these. There was technology which could lift it, but not lift and transport. Yet somehow, these were moved into place. They were lifted, they were taken from the quarry to where they eventually ended up. And that is the kind of stuff whereby you go, okay, scientists, please explain this. And science doesn't even address it. Science is, is actually quite interesting in, in saying that the Roman temple on top is, is really a, a temple which was the largest temple outside of the Roman Empire. The building stones used for that exceed pretty much just tiny bit, but still exceed the Roman engineering capabilities of their time. Scientists are quite clear about this, and they basically say that they don't really know how it was done. But that, you know, it, it was just off. So it, as if it's kind of like, you know, good enough. It's like, it's almost as saying, okay, we could build the Empire Spire State Building, but, we ex- but that was as far as we went. And then you looked right next to it and you find it a taller structure than the Empire State Building. And you kind of like want to say to science, okay, I know it's right next door and it's just slightly higher, but you said it's the small one next to it, which was at the summum of what we could build. So could you please explain the one next to it? Anyway, the fact I think is quite interesting that this expertise in building of Romans supersedes anything the Romans did precisely on a spot where the expertise in building, which you know exceeds everybody's understanding up until a few decades ago. And to me, that, that is evidence that something in Baalbek, um, you know, was definitely off and that to some extent there was maybe an understanding or a knowledge which kept living there um, and, and helped Romans into the construction of, of their building works. But when it comes to building projects as a whole, at this moment in time, it is easier to say that they were build using some form of technology than to say that that technology by default was extraterrestrial. If you want to make that jump, then really you need to uh, also rely on basically mythological or historical or anthropological records, which say that the local, you know, which, which basically goes that the locals are saying that they were not the ones building this, but that it were non-human intelligence who built this for them. And to some extent that is... Uh, subjective in the sense that the locals uh, might not know, they might have exaggerated, they might have invented, but they might also be telling the truth that is, you know, amongst the scope. But just on a pure archaeological record, a building, you know, will only be a building. Um, And it's a two-edged sword. If it was built from metal or from um, iron or something like that um, thousands of years ago, then it probably is no longer visible. So we do no longer have it. So the best chance of, of having something from that time is, is, is gone. What, what remains are buildings in stone, and these are buildings in stone. We can pinpoint the fact that they um, included high technology, but that it is it. You know, they are from terrestrial stone. Proving that they have an alien component um, is not easy. There always will have to be, I think, uh, a contextual context for that, and that context is that there has to be supporting evidence from from myths or legends which say that indeed these 
things were built by non-human intelligences. Well, that raises the other question, too. Is it possible here, rather than being from non-human intelligences, that we had some pretty advanced civilizations here on Earth thousands of years ago due to some kind of catastrophe, whatever, those civilizations died, vanished, and here we are. Absolutely, and they are um, likely going to be the subject of my next book. But all of those things, you know, like the story of Atlantis, they don't end up in my book, basically because there is nothing to suggest that Atlantis um, had anything to do with ET or non-human intelligences. For it, for but the why to- then assume or even speculate on the possibility that it had to be ET if there could have been an Atlantis? Because I'm not speculating. I am taking the mythological records of the ancient Egyptians and all these other people um, and saying that they themselves were saying that they were guided on the path of civilization by a non-human intelligence. You know, when it comes to the, the, the classical story, which probably illustrates this best, it's the story of Awanis. Awanis is described by a guy called Barossus, um, and Awanis is basically said to have given civilization to the ancient Babylonians. He is described as a creature which was half fish, half man, who came out yeah, of the There's something Persian fishy Gulf. about that. Uh-huh. Who came out of the Persian Gulf. During Can I the hear daytime. the bomb sound when I have jokes like that? No, because they say I tell bad jokes. Uh huh. Well, there's something um, fishy about a fish guy being responsible for civilization. I, you know. All right, don't don't gild the lily here. Go ahead, please. Uh, so basically, it, it's 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 a creature which is described as half fish, half man, who comes out of the Persian Gulf by daytime, teaches at night, goes back into the Persian Gulf the following morning or a few days later, comes back, and this goes on for seven such creatures. He's remembered in Sumerian civilizations as the Apkalu. So you have the ancient uh, Babylonians and to some extent the Sumerians saying that their civilization was given to them with the help of a non-human intelligence, Oanis and his likes. So I'm not speculating willy-nilly saying that that we cannot explain something about the Babylonian civilization so that by default it has to be ET, um, you know, if there was no mythological evidence or, or historical evidence uh, about a creature like Oannes, then yes, I would be speculating and I would have to go through through, through more um, hoops and loops to, to draw that conclusion. But in this case, it's our ancestors themselves who said that they were guided and instructed by non-human intelligences. Well, can that be a little bit fanciful too? In the well, sense it's... that we're reading stories now that may have had a partly fictional element. Didn't they write fiction then? Actually, they don't. And this is a bit – I mean, did they write fiction then? We assume that they wrote well, – co- did they write fiction? Yes. They wrote fiction and it was clearly identifiable as fiction. Um, but this idea, like, you know, could it be fiction? Yes, everything is possible. But Barossus was a, a, the guy who, who writes history. And this is the, the, the big thing which, which um, science does when it comes to Atlantis. Um, you know, Plato was both historian and philosopher. And so when you have the likes of Ken Feeder who argue that Atlantis was not a uh, real historical civilization – but that this is somehow the imagination of Plato, um, that he does this as an idealized state because he's going to give a lesson to his fellow Greeks as to how they are, you know, like really having dire morals and they need to have a, a moral lesson. Um, and therefore he sees um, the, the, uh, the civilization of Atlantis as something Plato invented. Well, Plato writes about uh, Atlantis in a book solely dedicated to history. He okay, is... and we'll get more into Plato's discussion of Atlantis and more with Philip Coppins, with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It just stopped responding. It took hours before it returned, but I'd already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Check it out. iWeb.com. That's iWeb.com. 
Fate Magazine provides true reports of the strange and unknown. Keep up with the latest on angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, life after death, and much, much more. To receive your free issue of Fate Magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit their website at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. Hey, everybody, Jason Lewis here once again. These are hard times for investors. If you're like me, you just don't know where to put your money because there's a downside to every possible scenario. Now, look, every portfolio needs a hedge for inflation. Gold has been the classic. I want to tell you, I want to be honest with you, commodities fluctuate. So you could lose money. Gold goes up and down. But every stable portfolio usually has an inflation hedge, and gold is, well, the gold standard. Washington is not going to get us out of this recovery. So you've got to protect yourself. Give it some thought. And if you're interested in converting your IRA to gold or would like to actually have it in your possession, call Midas Resources today at 1-800-686-2237. The U.S. dollar was once backed by gold, but it's lost a lot of its value since then. Call Midas Resources today, 1-800-686-2237 for gold. That's 1-800-686-2237 and tell them Jason Lewis sent you. Plant a healthy garden easy and fast with OrganicaSeed.com. Easy because OrganicaSeed.com offers one of the largest online selections of organic, heirloom, non-hybrid, and untreated seeds, as well as tobacco and cotton seeds at low prices. Go to OrganicaSeed.com, spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-C-A-Seed.com. OrganicaSeed.com. Remember, Organica Seed is healthy seed. HempUSA.org has a revolutionary wonder food for detoxing the body and rebuilding the immune system. Microplant powder can help unclog arteries and soften heart valves while removing heavy metals, virus, fungus, bacteria, and parasites. Plus, it cleans and purifies the blood, lungs, stomach, and colon. Keep your body clean with microplant powder. Visit us at HempUSA.org or call 908-691-2608 today. Big Berkey water filters are in high demand. Storable foods are also in high demand. BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com has always kept our focus on the Berkey water filter products. But increasingly, our customers have been asking for storable foods. After months of research, BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com now offers great-tasting, long-lasting, storable foods. These ready-to-eat meals are packed in airtight nitrogen pouches. All you do is just add water. And because they're sealed so well, they come with a 25-year shelf life. Combine our Berkey water filters, which are powerful enough to purify treated, untreated, or even stagnant pond water with our storable foods, and you have a winning combination. Remember, we offer free shipping on every order over $50, and GCN listeners receive 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Visit BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com or call 877-99-BERKEY. That's BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com or call 877-99-BERKEY today. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And if you'd like to catch up on past episodes, we have hundreds of shows for you to download direct from theparacast.com. That's theparacast.com. Or check us out at iTunes. Atlantis and more ancient civilizations. What was Plato talking about, writing about, with Philip Coppins on the Paracast? So let's continue that discussion. Let's take it further. So this book was a book about history, factual history. And if this is thrown in there, therefore we assume, Philip, this has to have been intended as factual information. Yes. And so at one point, you know, what the scientists are then saying is, well, you know, Plato is pretending. It's like Dan Brown, you know, in the Da Vinci Code. At, at the beginning, there's this line of like, these are facts. Um, and then, you know, they some of them don't turn out to be facts. Um, and so they're saying this is exactly what Plato is doing as well. Fair enough. That could be. But simply because an archaeologist thinks that something is possible doesn't mean it's possible. You know, you need to stick with the evidence. 
and the evidence is that Plato is saying that this is history, so you should stick with it until you can prove it is not. The assumption doesn't work the other way around as people want to have it. Now, the killer is this. Even in his own time, people in Athens are skeptical about what Plato is saying. And these skeptics jump in a boat and dash off to Egypt because this is where Plato's sources have heard about Atlantis. And they arrive in Egypt, they go to the temple, they speak to the priest, and in the full hope that this priest are going to say, I have no idea who you're talking about. I have no idea what you're talking about. Do you want to have a drink uh, because you've come such a long way and, you know, have a pleasant journey back? Well, what the priest says is, yes, I remember that person coming here. I can show you the column and the walls on which these um, myths and stories are told. And so what happens is that his skeptics go back to Greece. And when everybody, unfortunately for them, asks them, so how did it go in Egypt? They are fortunately honest enough to actually confess that what they indeed were confronted with was the fact that these stories existed on the Egyptian walls. Now, again, let's be devil's advocate here and say that this is not necessarily evidence of the existence of Atlantis. But what we are confronted with is the fact that the ancient Egyptians told Plato as if it were and could be history that there was a lost civilization of Atlantis. This is evidence. This is proven to be the case. Now look at what the archaeologists are saying. They're saying that Plato made this up. That is simply untenable. And they do this trick time and time again. They focus in on certain things. And the reason why, you know, like it's, it's great to have you as the devil's advocate and um, we, we all need to be devil's advocate. But the reason why there is this specific desire to be a devil's advocate in explaining things away is because scientists have been doing this all too often and have been getting away with it all too often. The reason why people in the past were writing about Atlantis, were writing about Zeus, were writing about all of these myths, which we considered to be myths, um, is because what they were saying is this. Our ancestors, and in our own times, saw strange things. We are writing down these things because the reason why we're writing down these things is because we want to leave a record to our descendants that reality seems to be far weirder then our eyes seem to suggest to us. And so we hope that you have a continuous record of the fact that weirdness, if it were to happen in your time, just doesn't originate in your time, but that is, has been happening for a very long period of time. Now, let well, me jump. Well, Phil, Philip, before you go on, let's, I want to get back to Gene's question real quick and kind of put it into, into a slightly uh, you know, more applied context here. Let's say that there was an Atlantis. Let's say there was Lemuria. How do we know that these ancient, ancient pre-antediluvian, I guess, uh, cultures uh, didn't have high technology? They didn't have power tools. They, uh, maybe they had some sort of uh, exotic ability to hover huge uh, megalithic stones with sound is, is one theory that I've heard. And, and this, would, this would then put the whole idea of alien intervention or some sort of off-planet or extraterrestrial intervention you know, would, would be um, a moot point because if perhaps humans did at one point in the, in the very ancient past have exalted technology. That's one, one area that I think a lot of, of people who look as you do creatively at this ancient alien question – you have to factor in that possibility. I do and I don't. First of all, I don't because the, the, the topics I'm talking about do not date back to 20, 30,000 years or however old you want to do Atlantis. You know, the Atlantis question begins to take effect basically 9,000 BC and, and further back in time. So when we're talking to things like Pumapunku, um, we are definitely on, on this side of that divide. Now, you would then begin to, to, to maybe argue, which you can, that there were descendants of Atlantis. But I would then argue, where is the evidence? The evidence today is there, which says whether it's in Babylonia or in other, you know, not all civilizations, but, but several of them. But again, let's stick with the Babylonian one, because that's the example I have been using so far for, for ease's sake. The Babylonian tradition about Oanes is not saying that they were given the, the gifts of civilization from some lost civilization of Atlantis or some other thing. They were saying they were given this gift by a creature which was non-human. 
That is the evidence. All the rest we can speculate about as wildly as possible. And, you know, is it possible that there are, let's say, you know, that there is somewhere evidence of a lost civilization of Atlantis and that they had high technology and that this um, evidence is somewhere on, the, on this planet? I think the answer is probably yes. But that yes doesn't mean that we can extrapolate that yes to, you know, let's whatever number we're going to use, let's say five, five artifacts. It could be a thousand, it could be one, it doesn't matter. But the five artifacts which do fall in that category, you cannot extrapolate and then say, oh, well, this proves that all, you know, that this applies to everything. That's simply not the case. There is evidence. Yeah, yeah, you, you can't use that broad of a brushstroke, obviously. But perhaps there were vestiges of this technology that did survive into the ancient uh, you know, cultures that we now know uh, definitively that existed, uh, the Sumeria, the, the Harappan culture, Egypt, obviously, maybe some ancient Mesoamerican cultures. So perhaps these are vestiges of, of information and technology that, that then disappeared. We don't really know. I, I just find it very, very intriguing that uh, you would have similar myths that are found around the world that do suggest that there has been some sort of intervention on some level. Of course, you know, Viracocha comes to mind, Quetzalcoatl in the Meso- Mesoamerican systems and, and, and others in the East. So, so where, where do we go? I mean, how do we, if we can't get science to come forward and do the proper work and do the proper analysis of, of these sites and publish their, their work in a timely manner, I mean, what, what recourse do we have other than to write books and scratch our heads and, and speculate? Before your head is scratched any further, and maybe we don't want to build up the sores there to be graphic about it, let me tell our listeners, if you have a comment or a question about the show, write us, news at thepowercast.com, news at thepowercast.com. The book from Philip Coppins is called The Ancient Alien Question, A New Inquiry into the Existence, Evidence, and Influence of Ancient Visitors. You're with Gene and Chris. You're in The Paracast. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. Ray Perkins, a reclusive veteran burned out from the Gulf War, lives tortured by relentless, perplexing nightmares. Nightmares of a horrific battle in deep space and of a mysterious woman suffering in agony for her devastated world. A woman not yet born, calling across centuries to him. Then... A coincidence leads him to his destiny, his chance to alter the universe. Attack Attack. of the Rockwells. The former fiction editor for Star Wars and Indiana Jones, Robert Simpson, writes, The soul of the novel Attack of the Rockwells lies in its heart and passion for building a convincing tale of a love that spans the galaxy. A thrilling story. Attack Attack. of the Rockwells is available now. Read a sample chapter and get a special discount off of the cover price at our website, rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S. Dot com. Attack, attack of the Rockwell, a novel in the grand science fiction tradition. Local Army Navy surplus stores are hard to find these days, but not military issue supplies. They're right here online at mainmilitary.com. That's right, just like the state, M-A-I-N-E, military.com. We have everything for true, total preparedness. MainMilitary.com is not a typical website. It has much more than your old surplus store. Quality military-issue survival gear like canteens, mess kits, utensils, gas masks, filters, and chemical suits, magnesium fire-starting tools, strike anywhere, waterproof, and storm matches, first aid kits, splints, tourniquets, parachute 550 cord, military manuals, sandbags by the bail, and a huge Molly assortment of vests and pouches for every need. Call 207-989-6783, 207-989-6783, or visit MainMilitary.com. That's M-A-I-N-E, Military.com, the main name in military supply. Positive results from satisfied customers of heart and body extract continue to pour into our website, hbextract.com. This is Al from New Jersey. One day I saw your ad for heart and body extract, and it mentioned that it would help me with angina, so I decided to order. I figure I had nothing to lose. Heart and body extract supplies your body with everything it needs to balance itself and maintain optimal heart and circulatory health with no negative side effects. 
I took the formula three times a day as directed, and I kid you not, within four days, my angina pain was completely gone. Order HB Extract by calling 866-295-5305 or online at hbextract.com. That's 866-295-5305 or hbextract.com. I could not believe it actually stopped the pain. Heart and Body Extract actually works. This is just an amazing product. Even the numbness in my hands is completely gone. Heart and Body Extract for a long and healthy life. Do you owe the IRS money you can't pay? Then listen carefully because you already know that the problem won't go away by itself. You can get help today from the leading tax expert in the country, Dan Pilla. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla. The IRS isn't going to just forget about you. Right now, the IRS is hiring thousands of tax collectors to go after delinquent accounts just like yours. That's why you need to take action today, and I can help. I take a simple but proven approach to solving your tax debt problem. First, I stabilize collections so you don't have to worry about wage and bank levies. Next, I build a detailed plan to get your debt reduced to the fullest extent possible, sometimes even eliminated. Finally, I work with you every step of the way to get your problem solved once and for all. So call now for a free consultation. Call 1-800-346-6829. Dan Pilla will solve your tax problem guaranteed. He's helped thousands of people, and he can help you too. Call us today at 800-346-6829. That's 800-34-NO-TAX. This is Hilly Rose, and I hope that you do listen to the Paracast because you will learn a great deal about the paranormal. We continue with Philip Coppins about ancient astronauts and focusing on a lot of different questions, as is his want. Chris O'Brien asks a lengthy question. We give you the break to figure out the answer. Philip, what's your answer? Well, you know... We are back to, let's go back to 1968. Eric von Däniken writes Chariots of the Gods and asked 237 question marks in that book. 45 years later, some of these question marks are still out there because science hasn't addressed these things. Now, that doesn't mean nothing has has changed. So I use the example in the book of the Nazca lines. The Nazca lines in 1968 were something nobody had really heard of. There was a lone German woman called Maria Reiki who almost single-handedly protected these lines. And Eric was told that he should go there and look at them. And what he does is he says, okay, this is interesting. These lines are clearly meant to be seen from the sky. He also points out that sections of the geoglyphs of of the Nazca lines look, and the keyword is here, like an airport. I want to ask you something, but maybe phrase this in a little bit of a story, I'll tell you. Okay? Now, I know what Eric von Daniken says about the Nazca lines. Here's another story for you. Jim Mosley, publisher originally of Saucer News and Saucer Smear, used to go to Peru to, as they say, acquire artifacts for sale, okay? He calls himself, quote-unquote, a grave robber of ancient graves. Yona Fortner, the guy I talked to you about before, the guy who was writing about ancient astronauts, back in the late 50s or early 60s, they went to Peru. Jim financed Yona's trip to Peru. And understand, Yona suffered from polio as a child. He was handicapped, was wheelchair-bound, so this was rather difficult. He somehow or had his assistants go up on a ladder to look at the Nazca lines. They could see it. They didn't have to be way up in the sky. What's your response? No, you don't have to be way up in the sky to see them. But as a whole, they are meant to be seen from the sky. There is clearly uh, a difference between seeing them from a ladder and seeing them from the sky. I'll get to the, to, to a point which kind of like, you know, makes this, this even more apparent. When we are, you know, in 1968 and von Daniken puts this out there on the big canvas. He is is basically, you know, confronting scientists with the fact that, A, they have no scientific publications about this. They have never looked at this. So they begin to do the investigation. Now, where are we uh, roughly 45 years later? We have scientists out there who are saying that, in their opinion, these geoglyphs were indeed meant to be seen from the sky, and they are pointing out that it is, in their opinion, quite likely that the people of the Nazca culture, who, by the way, was extraordinary, they were a pyramid-building culture, 
that these people had hot air balloons with which they took to the sky and basically looked to the, the geoglyphs from their hot air balloons. And they have basically identified uh, sections near the, the geoglyphs whereby it is believed that actually the, the hot air was created uh, to, to power this, these balloons you know, with, with fire. Now, when you look at, again, when you look at this, the, the skeptical scientist, he will say, well, you know, von Däniken said, first of all, he will not say like an airport. He will say it, that von Däniken said it was an airport. And he will say, you see, we've proven von Däniken wrong. No, what we have proven, if anything, is that von Däniken said these things were meant to be seen from the sky. And now we have scientists who are saying, actually, there is evidence to suggest that the people who were part of this culture actually did have um, flying capabilities. Now, at no point in time, at this moment in time, um, are, is there any evidence to suggest that this was E.T.? So in that case, the ancient alien question has a negative answer. But he has pushed science, first of all, into forcing them to um, you know, address the issue and go and explore these things. And I think after 45 years, science has been looking into some of these things, but it has not looked at all too detailed in, in some of these things. And again, when they are confronted with the ultimate thing, when they can't almost get underneath it, um, they will do so um, just as a reaction to ancient aliens because because of its popularity. You have students who are asking their history professors and their archaeology professors in American universities. Yeah. And, their, and their answer is, we know. And when the students ask, yeah. well, how do you know? These, the professors say, we know. So say it louder. And you know what? Yeah, you know, like, we just it sounds know. like The Shadow, you know, in the movie The Shadow, where he always says, the shadow knows, or I know. Well, here's another one, Philip. How about the kite flyers? I remember some years back, uh, I saw it in, I think, National Geographic. They had found some uh, graves in the Nazca area that uh, featured uh, interned bodies uh, with their giant kites. And uh, mm -hmm. one theory was floated. I remember that these guys actually were uh, possibly directing the construction of the Nazca lines, uh, flying on these uh, tethered, uh, very large kites. Yes, and uh, other research which is happening, uh, I think, in the California desert is about the possibility that some of these uh, stones which were used in the Giza Plateau also involved kites. kites. So th this kite technology is something else which our ancestors seem to have developed relatively commonly um, in our past to, to get around certain problems of, of building or construction. So, you know, again, but, but even when it comes to, to, the, to the kite technology, you know, the, the, the people who are involved in this are amateur scientists who are begging mainstream science to get involved and on board with them. And they quite often interest television programs more easily to help them experiment and help them pay um, for some of the experiments that they're willing to do um, rather than find scientists who, um, you know, actually should be um, more eager and definitely have more time and more capabilities of, of doing this. But um, it's, it's slow progress. Okay, it what sure is the is. official word from science about the Nazca lines? Just artwork? <laughs> well, there, there is no such thing as, as, a, as a consensus view. Um, in fact, that there are, and this this is actually isn't a theory from an acceptance scientist. So, sorry, from an official scientist. But like you know, Tony, Tony Morrison kind of like did some research on the Nazca lines, and he basically felt that they were to be seen by the shaman during his out of body experience, um, and that he would fly over the, the Nazca lines as such. Uh, again, everything about the Nazca lines. Um, you know, they say that they were scraped off and that they have been there for hundreds of years, um, and and that is pretty much it. They they have identified that there are certain places along those geoglyphs um, which um, had to do with with ancestor worship. When you ask them what what was first, there is no clear consensus view. When you ask them whether the geoglyphs were before uh, the lines. Uh, or vice versa, there is no consensus view. Um, there, um, you know, there have been nearby structures found, um, including human remains, uh, grave goods, and, 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 and pyramids. Um, there's a clear connection between those and the Nazca lines. But again, um, when you ask which specific phase of that culture uh, would have done this, um, you, you get several answers, but no clear uniform um, answer. And it is simply because science is not you know 
addressing these things. If, if there is an archaeologist working on the Nazca lines and you ask him, so what are you doing? He will say that he's working on, um, you know, l- l- slightly joking here, the west side of the fifth pyramid uh, and that he has no idea what's happening on the east side of the fourth pyramid. And again, in 10 <laughs> years, and in 10 years, he will publish about the, the, the west side of, of the fifth pyramid and will have to wait for somebody to kind of like, you know, write about the east side of the fourth pyramid. But nobody is doing, okay, let's look at everything here um, and, and, and see what we have. It's just not happening. Archaeology is not doing it. They're basically well, treating what? them as separate events, not integrated. Yeah, the, yeah. It, it, is, it is so isolationist. It's incredible. <laughs> Sounds like well, a one case thing of we, tunnel we, vision. Go ahead, Chris. One thing we do know uh, is, you know, of course, one of the most famous uh, postulations that von Donneken came up with was the famous lid of the first found uh, Mayan uh, tomb, uh, the King Pakal, and uh, and the sarcophagus lid, which is 12 feet by 5 feet, I think, weighs 10,000 pounds. It's underneath the Temple of Inscriptions at Palenque. And, of course, von Donneken's interpretation of the figure assumed to be Pakal um, looks like he's riding a rocket ship. I'll tell you now, what, we're going to ride this rocket ship. With Philip Coppins, with Gene and Chris, you're in the Paracast. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs. Convert from so many formats, I can't even list them. Download now to see see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. Survival of the fittest. In any and all situations, survival is your number one priority. That requires being tough and thinking smart. And the folks at Freeze Dry Guy are going to help you do just that. They have the long range patrol ration entrees, what they call the Brick Pack. When you're in survival mode, it is absolutely the best item for your survival pack or bug out bag. You can go farther, faster, and carry more food with the LRP cold weather ration entrees. Not only do these long-lasting, durable entrees help sustain you or your family through the harshest environment or situation, they are by far the most delicious of their kind. No contest. With a variety of tasty entrees, you can't beat the LRP Brick Packs. Let Freeze Dry Guy help you in your survival situations. Go to freezedryguy.com. That's freezedryguy.com. Or call 866-404-3663. That's 866-404-FOOD. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over six years in serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey Guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light Systems system today complete with two black Berkey elements for only $231 and the Berkey guy will ship your order free of charge. With the purchase of a Berkey light, the Berkey guy is also offering a set of fluoride and arsenic filters for only $39.99. That's over 30% off the retail price. Call the Berkey guy at 1-877-886-3653. That's 1-877-886-3653 or order online at goberkey.com. That's goberkey.com today. 
Hi, I'm Mark Craighead, founder of Crossbreed Holsters. I designed our top-selling holster, the Super Tuck Deluxe, to solve the problems of being poked, pinched, and gouged while carrying concealed. The Super Tuck Deluxe is the most comfortable, most concealable holster on the market today. We offer a two-week free trial and a lifetime warranty. Visit us at crossbreedholsters.com. Don't forget, crossbreedholsters.com. That's the sound of your door being kicked in by an intruder with a single kick. That's the sound of the same door now protected by the Door Sentinel at MySafeDoor.com. Go to MySafeDoor.com right now and watch the amazing video. At MySafeDoor.com, you'll learn how to turn your home into a fortress with the Door Sentinel. 16 kicks later, and the Door Sentinel is still holding strong. MySafeDoor.com. That's MySafeDoor.com. This is Kurt Seven, the author of UFO Mysteries, and you're listening to the Paracast. Well, we're not going to come down to Earth for a while, because you're in the Paracast with Gene and Chris and Philip Coppins exploring ancient mysteries. And Chris was talking about another fascinating possibility, Chris. It actually becomes uh, rather mundane. Uh, back in the late 60s, early 70s, when Von Donneken uh, really first hit, uh, <laughs> it started selling millions of books, I might add. Uh, one of the things that I remember from that time period, of course, I, I devoured everything that he wrote uh, early on. And the whole idea of Pakal on that sarcophagus lid is is riding a rocket up into the sky. As I was saying before the break, at the time, we hadn't deciphered the Mayan glyphs, the Mayan language. We only knew about 5% of the language. In the intervening years, archaeologists have pretty much deciphered the entire Mayan lang- language, with the exception of how to pronounce the names of, of some of the gods. They haven't been able to figure out how to pronounce all the T's and X's and P's and L's. But one thing that we do know is every single bit of information on that sarcophagus lid, and it's not Pakal riding a rocket ship up into the sky. He's actually sliding down the tree of life into Shibilba, the Mayan underworld, and he's preparing to meet the Wheats monster. And that is the conventional um, wisdom in archaeology. Linda Sheely and her team did a, a magnificent job in the 80s of deciphering the language. So in one sense, you're refuting, well, academia is refuting uh, the interpretation by Van Donneken of Pakal's lid. But at the same time, this is still being touted as evidence of, you know, ancient uh, Mayan being somehow connected with the, uh, with the stars and possibly E.T. Where do you come down on that? Well, in my book, I, I, I go into that um, and, and basically sh- use, show that as uh, one piece of evidence where von Daniken has been refuted in his, in his speculation. Uh, I think it's always extremely dangerous, and um, you know, this is not just something to, to, to Eric's um, point, but to everybody's, um, to interpret a, a visual. The Lord Pakal thing is probably the most famous of it, but it happens also in the in in the temple complex of Dendera. I didn't put it in the book because it is it was too complex to actually um, explain it, but it is on my website, philipcoppins.com, if you want to uh, go into it. But um, in in the Dendera case, there is this this depiction in a uh, chamber deep inside the complex. Um, seldom visited by by people uh, because you need special permission of of people which seem to hold giant light giant bulbs. Light bulbs, <laughs> they do look like light bulbs too. And you know, absolutely, they exactly do like giant light bulbs. Just like when you turn Lord Pakal's um, tombstone around ninety degrees, it looks as if he's riding a, a rocket ship. But they're not light bulbs. They are. Um, and again, it's actually too complex to go into here. But the end conclusion of it is that this um, that this chamber uh, had to do with the preparation of a sacred marriage ritual involving the the, the resident deities, um, some of whose statues were held there, and that this um, 
that this depiction was one of, uh, I might mis- be mistaken with the number, it's either four or six. And when you put them all four or six in the proper context, you really have the preparation of the statue um, for its sacred marriage um, ritual, which is about to be performed. So when you take things out of context, uh, or if you're just impressed by an image, um, then you, then you, you know, you might, you might get it wrong, and it's it's always dangerous to speculate there. But but again, uh, I I'm also of the conviction that an, an image alone, specifically when it comes to um, a, a drawing rather than a photograph, um, is 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 you know it it cannot be there as as the best evidence. It 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 can be used as an indication um, or a possibility. But um, as soon as as you were pointing out, the text get translated. Um, you will either be quickly proven right or quickly be proven wrong. <laughs> well, another thing that uh, – that it, in terms of in- enigmas, historical visual artifacts that are, in my opinion, most enigmatic, the, the Piri Rees map, which you have a very, very good reproduction of in your book, by the way, that is, to me, one of the strongest – bits of evidence that we have to push a case for some sort of ability to see the planet surface from the air in an ancient time way before there was the possibility of any sort of flight because as most of our listeners know the map um, I think was comes from Turkey it's probably a reproduction of another map I you go over the the artifact very well in your book by the way but it shows the coastline of South America and most importantly, it shows the coastline of Antarctica before it appeared to be covered with ice. Uh, where do you come down on that? That's, that's in my mind, one of the best, uh, I think, most enigmatic artifacts that we have. Before you answer, Philip, believe it or not, Major Donald Kehoe, when he was speculating about UFOs coming from outer space, the Perry Reese map was used as evidence of possible ET visitation and mapping. Many, many, many years ago. What's your take? Um, I, you know, the, writing that aspect of the Piri Rice map was extraordinarily difficult because um, <laughs> the, the Piri, map, Piri Rice map discussion could have become one of these things which took over the entire book. So I had to try and reduce it into its proper um, framework. And I really took on board everything which the proponents of the Piri Rice map for its anomalous origins said. Um, and I also took on board what, every, what all the skeptics were saying, because again we are confronted with a drawing. We're not confronted with, with you know, w- w- there's analysis involved, and analysis by default um, at, is is more subjective than, than than some other things than analysis by by machinery, for example. Um, but I, uh, the indications to me are that at this moment in time. The, the Piri Rice map and its showing of the coastline of, of South America and the coastline of Antarctica, uh, it seems to be on the side of those proposing that this is indeed showing those coastlines of, of South America and um, the Antarctica. Now, it's not a battle which I consider to be completely won for, the, for, for those proponents. Um, again, there is, there is um, room for interpretation but somebody really needs to go into that um, Piri Rice map controversy with extraordinarily open focus and extraordinary detail uh, before a, a, a rigid conclusion can be drawn. And that research hasn't happened. Um, right now, when um, and, I, and I tried to word this, um, basically I, I looked for the best evidence which the skeptics could throw at the Piri Rice map, and it's full short um, you know they haven't been able to to use their term debunk it. Um, what they, is the official skeptic explanation, or is there more than one? Uh, again, there is more than one, but basically they are pointing out that it, it's not as clear cut as some of the proponents of the Piri Rice map are saying. They're they're basically saying that there are still sections missing from uh, the South American coastline, even if you take everything on board there. Um, they're they're, they're um, addressing some other problems. Um, you know, nobody is saying that the Piri Rice map... Actually, one, I mean, but before I continue, actually one, one, one fun comment was um, when somebody was told that the Piri Rice map you know, showed all of these things, the only thing he had to say was that, well, you know, in, in the following decades, there were better maps than the Piri Rice map. And it's like, 
that's not the point. You know, it's like, yes, today there are better maps than, than the Piri Rice map. It, it's not at all the point. Um, but, you know, the thing is that the Piri Rice map was good enough and it's clear enough and it's pointing out enough um, anomalies. And basically the, the linchpin, um, the, the, the critical piece of, of evidence, so to speak, um, is that the, the certain section of South America of the Piri Rice map um, is either precisely that and or it's Antarctica. And that is kind of like the winning grace at this moment in time for um, the proponents that the Piri, Piri Rice map contains uh, extraordinary information because it is showing something. It is showing a coastline in detail. And, you know, it, it's, it's not somebody's imagination. It's not somebody who just drew lines um, because he didn't know what was going on. It's clearly based on something. Um, and, and that is kind of like the winning grace as to why um, really the, the bunkers cannot be, cannot be shown um, to, be, to be right. But again, the Piri Rice map is a very tough one. There's an awful lot of analysis involved. Um, and there needs to be done an extraordinary amount of, of analysis uh, by somebody who's, who's basically willing to devote his, entire, his or her entire life uh, to it um, before we are going to have a definitive uh, analysis, um, which you know um, is, is probably going to be extremely controversial and, in my opinion, is going to, to show uh, that the likes of Hapgood and other people who have always said that this, this map contained anomalies um, – you know, it's, it's going to, I think, uh, show that, that they were right. Now, I'll tell you what, right or wrong, we have Philip Coppins with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you'd like to listen to GCN programs on the go, I have great news. GCN has created a Droid and iPhone application, and it's free. Just as easy as going to GCNlive.com, click on the banner, and download. Before you know it, you'll be listening to your favorite hard-hitting GCN shows, live or on demand, right on your Droid or iPhone, 24-7 and on the go. So download the Droid and iPhone app free by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Thanks again for listening to GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. We the people grow cotton, weave fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit and carting to a private bank, having it lent back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Ted Anderson, I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. In our final hour of the show with Philip Coppins talking about ancient mysteries, possible ancient astronauts. Now, this particular map, do we think it's based on older map source material? Can we take it back to earlier maps that may show so-called anomalies, Philip? Yes. Uh, basically, again, further detail needs to happen, but it is clear that one of the maps used used a projection of the world based on Alexandria. And then, to cut long story short, um, basically, the, the not the consensus view, but the general view is that what was likely happening was that some of these maps were um, taken uh, from from Alexandria, maybe even as far back as the Alexandrian Library. So some of this thing clearly um, says that there were ancient maps which Piri Rice used in the creation of um, this this map. But where these maps precisely came from, some of them have been identified, but others have not. We know that stuff from the Alexandrian Library was basically came about again in, in Renaissance times, specifically in Florence, Venice, uh, Venice. and P 
people who were ex- sponsoring an awful lot of the expeditions to the New World uh, can also be traced back to to Florence and, and Venice. Amerigo Vespucci, for example, is, is a child of Florence. There is definite evidence to, to take it back to Alexandria, but then once you reach Alexandria, Alexandria, you come with the problem of, you know, where do we go from here? Now, the um, other question is, still, even if everything is correct, this is something that may have required some kind of aerial travel to do this mapping. Did we do it or did ET help us? Well, again, at this moment in time, you know, if we were flying to map that, again, to cut a long story short, it is believed that the kind of projection involved um, and the accuracy of Antarctica... Some people say that it requires satellite technology. Um, I have seen discussions which kind of like show that it's not that accurate, uh, but it is, it's, it's quite accurate. And basically, um, it's a moot point. Either there was satellite technology flying around the Earth in the last 12,000 years, and somehow that satellite photograph was made into a map and then given to somebody and then given to Piri Rice, or somebody had drawn a map of Antarctica um, more than 10, 12,000 years ago when that shoreline w- was uh, not covered with so much ice. And so the two possibilities, again, push it far back to a civilization which, you know, was was very far advanced. Now, in the case of, of the Piri Rice map, the, the evidence of a lost civilization um, cannot be as easily excluded um, as that. Um, the, the debate about the Piri Rice will always center, and again, this is something which is going to be an awful long time in the future unless somebody has been studying it for a very long period of time and hasn't gone public with it. If the assumption is that it required some form of satellite technology, then from everything which we know about civilization, even lost civilizations, um, the evidence clearly suggests that a satellite photograph or satellite imagery was outside of the realm of these lost civilizations. Now, that's the other question I want to ask you here, because we're down to the last three and a half segments of the show, to put it all together. Is it possible here to consider this? What if our civilization ended tomorrow for whatever reason? And now we assume some primitive form of humans do survive, but our major parts of our civilization are gone. What's it going to look like 10,000 years from now? Well, it's something which I put in the opening of, of the book, because we went to the moon. We went to the moon uh, on a number of occasions, and then we stopped going. Four years later, what we're having right now is that there are people who are basically saying that we never went to the moon at all. So there is this controversy um, that we might never have gone to the moon anyway. And this is 40 years in. Imagine 500 years from now, even if civilization is is you know not going to drop that um, – if some of our books survive from this day and it happens to be The Dark Moon or some of Richard Hoagland's uh, books, then you know we're going to be confronted with the possibility that people in our future are going to believe that we never went to the moon. Parenthetically, if- do you believe Richard Hoagland? No. Okay. Just asking. Go ahead. <laughs> and so here we are. And, and so here we are. With the with with this weird conception that we might go down into history as a civilization where our ancestors will say they never went to the moon. There is no evidence for this. And they would be right because I don't think anything which is on Cape Canaveral uh, is built in such a way that it is going to survive 5,000 years. In fact, you know, it's built on a piece of land which with a giant wave um, could destroy pretty much everything. And and the real capability of Cape Canaveral, uh, the booster, um, the the real launch platforms are are almost all um, metal. So... You know, 500, 1,000, 5,000 years from now, we might be confronted with no evidence whatsoever that we in 1969 went to the moon and that there is a controversial evidence uh, which might have survived uh, 5,000 years, um, which suggests that even in our own time, there was debate about whether or not we went to the moon. And this is the same attitude, this, this skepticism, which is giving uh, itself over as to you know why did why did our ancestors ever have this kind of contact? Um, it is skepticism because we are um, debating what our ancestors were saying themselves. Our ancestors were you know quite homogeneous about the fact that we did go. 
uh, that we had, um, sorry, not that we did go, that we had contact um, with um, non-human intelligences. And I think what we need to have um, for the sake of humanity, not just for the ancient alien theory, um, but for the sake of humanity, is more acceptance that you know people what they're saying is what they're saying. That not everybody is always lying. Um, this is something which which is um, becoming inbred in our in our society, and it's it's not helping us uh, in any way or shape. We should be we should be critical. We should be rational. We should be, you know, to some extent, the devil's advocate. But those three should never mask um, or be, um, you know, um, basically be be an excuse to be skeptical. Um, that is not serving. That is not serving anybody. We have a number of questions. A few questions from our listeners because we kind of booked this too late to get a big response. But Chris, you have a couple of questions from our listeners about Philip. Yeah, I do. I do. And uh, there's a good one from uh, one of our latest, uh, you know, new members from uh, the forum here at the Paracast.com. And it's from a guy calling himself Six Dollar Man. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, I'm not ask like the, the Six Dollar Burger from Carl's Jr., huh? Well, I, I think maybe it's a Six Million Dollar Man, sort of a play on that. But uh, in regarding megalithic architecture, Philip. What about it points necessarily to ETs? Much has been said of the precision fit of stones in ancient buildings in, you know, like in Peru, uh, as we were discussing earlier. And uh, he's curious whether anyone has ever cut open one of these large megalithic blocks to look for hints that the stone was somehow deformed, whether by acid, sound, heat, or something else, sometime after its initial formation. Um, he gives the example of like anomal, anomalous strata or grain in sed, uh, sedimentary stone or oddly oriented crystals or magnetic particles that wouldn't exist under normal conditions of rock formation. Has any sort of geophysical work uh, like that uh, been done, do you know? Um, the short answer is no, um, but obviously on some occasions uh, these stones have collapsed um, and, and people have looked into them and um, you know, from a visual um, analysis or an early exploration of them, uh, nobody has, has done anything further with that. Really the, the technology there uh, is, is very much that you know, these people were building these stones in a way that they realized that they were more resistant to, to earthquakes and they were clearly aware that fitting them all together was going to be an extremely difficult task but which they um, were able to, to pull off. When you uh, say that, I kind of think we should get the information to Governor Brown of California just in case the big one hits there. But seriously speaking, we have Philip Coppins. If you have a comment or a question about the Paracast, please let us know. Please write us, news at theparacast.com. Once again, that's news at theparacast.com. And by the way, we also have those great Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Once again, that's forum.theparacast.com. Pay us a visit. You're listening to Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. Are you ready to order the official Paracast t-shirt? You asked, we answered. We're now taking orders for the official Paracast t-shirt. It comes in white, 100% cotton. The front of it features the same logo that we have on our community forums. On the back it says, separating signal from noise. To order the official Paracast t-shirt, here's all you have to do. Visit our new online store at store.theparacast.com. One more time, that's store.theparacast.com. You can use a major credit card to place your order for the official Paracast t-shirt. Hey, neighbors, we have one more thing to talk about, and that's more merchandise at the official Paracast store. We have hats, we have jackets, we even have a flip video camcorder customized with the Paracast logo at the official Paracast store. It's all now available at the official Paracast store, store store.theparacast.com. When making important financial decisions, you should always know the facts. That's why Midas Resources is willing to pay you to read the facts. Midas Resources, a team of hand-picked financial specialists with decades of financial experience who are ready to provide you with state-of-the-art, up-to-date financial services. Midas Resources offers a host of services and stands behind their products. In fact, if you call and order their free Midas report, Midas Resources will pay you. 
This detailed report will provide you with financial history on the safest and most profitable areas to invest in. If you read the report, Midas Resources will send you a free Walking Liberty Silver Half Dollar. So what are you waiting for? Get the facts and call Midas Resources toll free at 888-292-2709. That's 888-292-2709. And remember, if you read the Midas report, you'll receive a free Walking Liberty Silver Half Dollar. What happened, man? You used to be energetic, happy, and wow, did the ladies love you. Now, you fall asleep on the couch, irritable, and out of shape. Don't be that guy. Call now for a risk-free trial of Ageless Male, a natural supplement shown to raise testosterone by 50% and maintain healthy, normal levels. No injections, no appointments. With healthy testosterone levels, you can feel that energy again, that great outlook again, and yes, even a healthy sex drive. Right now, you can try Ageless Male risk-free. There's nothing to lose, guys. If you're a man who's noticed changes in your body, your mood, your sex life, call now for a risk-free trial of Ageless Male. Be the guy you used to be. Just call 1-888-246-0623. Don't wait another day. Just call 1-888-246-0623. Again, 1-888-246-0623. Smokers, are you still smoking traditional cigarettes? Are you still smelling up your clothes and car interior, staining your teeth, and getting ashes everywhere? Why? When you could be smoking or vaping with e-cigarettes by LaSig. With LaSig e-cigarettes revolutionary microelectronic technology, rechargeable battery, and unique replacement cartridges, you'll get all the satisfaction of smoking, but no smoking hazards. Choose from a wide variety of our new American-made Vapriate e-liquid flavors at LaSig.com, spelled L-E-C-I-G.com, or call 870-518-4307. That's 870-518-4307. LaSig e-cigarettes for today's modern smoker. Warning. E-cigs may contain nicotine, an addictive substance known to the state of California to cause birth defects or cancer. Please be aware of the risks associated with e-cigs prior to use. You must be 18 years or older to purchase. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And if you'd like to catch up on past episodes, we have hundreds of shows for you to download direct from theparacast.com. That's theparacast.com. Or check us out at iTunes. With Gene and Chris and the Paracast exploring ancient mysteries, ancient civilizations, ancient astronauts, whatever, with Philip Coppins, the answer you were giving about this more resilient method of construction. Do you have any further to add before we go on? Nope. Chris, another question or two? I I do. I have uh, another one. And this is from Ox Dead Beef. He's also a fairly new forum member. What is that name again? Ox I hope I don't see one of these at night in Brooklyn. (laughs) I want my Ox. No, it's Halloween. Why does your forum have very weird names, and why are people on your forum not just known as Mike or Jeff and Chris? <laughs> well, we do have a few, but uh, <laughs> your I'm just trying to, give, me. I'm trying to give these uh, people a shout out. One well, of you didn't reasons, have to Philip, live with that forum for five and a half years, Philip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons, Philip, is because we have a lot of scientists, people with uh, sensitive jobs and lives that wouldn't necessarily be served by getting busted by someone doing a, uh, a you know, a, a name check on and then finding them on a paranormal forum board. Um, that's one of the main reasons why a lot of people uh, we we do have a very 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 bright uh, <laughs> set of posters on our on our forum. Some uh, that just uh, I mean they're too smart for their own good. But this is a really interesting question, and and this is something that you kind of hint around at in your book there towards the end. I think it's the second to last chapter about uh, uh, DNA. 
and genetics. And uh, the question is, regarding the idea that earlier ancient man was genetically manipulated by an outside force, whatever, ETs, Middle Earth men, bog monsters from the moon, etc., what new developments or discoveries have been made during the last few years to indicate or support the idea that the human genome was tampered with? That's question one. Some sort of artificial marker or other abnormalities that would indicate outside influences or something uh, the rest of the, of the species on this planet share or we lack or we have and they lack, perhaps. In other words, he's saying I know that most species on Earth share 90 percent or something like that of the same genetic structure with just a few tweaks or differences to make diverse range, the diverse range of species that we see. So – He's going off the assumption that now with the mapping of the human genome complete and thousands of scientists and biotech labs studying each gene sequence every day looking for hidden gems that they can patent or sell off and he uses an expletive after that. Perhaps something new or interesting has surfaced recently. Now, you mentioned in your book uh, and you go into some, some pretty good detail about the, Marsh, or the Martian meteorites. We had Dr. John Brandenburg on the show who also – uh, it was fascinating, some of the information that he's gleaned over the years. Uh, he, he even s- suggested that the Precambrian explosion of life on this planet may have been seeded by Mars. What, uh, to your knowledge, have there been any new revelations here in the past few years that, uh, that may suggest a jump start in human evolution, let's say? Uh, of course, the, you know, the whole Zechariah Sitchin tinkering by Inkian and Lil comes to mind in, in his, uh, his particular uh, take on it. Do you know of any uh, recent developments in uh, genetics that might suggest we have uh, some hidden markers or something? Or um, I mean, first of all, the, the the Sitchin thing is is something which I hold very little uh, credibility or credulity out for. The answer before is before you is, even go to that answer. Why do you give Sitchin very low credibility? Um, because basically, in the book, I I show that he was um, very selective when he sometimes cited sources and also that he was wrong on some extraordinarily big things, uh, which for years he didn't address his skeptics at two things, if you want me to go on such and Sure, first. I think I'd like to before you continue with the answer, yes. Okay, so, so one thing is that Sitchin basically says that he could translate certain uh, Sumerian words correctly, whereas scientists had mistranslated these. Yeah, well, like it's not Shem. A Precisely. It's not a problem of mistranslation. The Sumerians had a lexicon, and so they defined uh, mu and sham and all of these words um, in a certain way. The definition which they give to their own words is not what Sitchin says they are. These are not spacecraft in the Sumerian lexicon. We have that still at our disposal. So it's not a problem of translation. But the one thing which really made me lose all respect for Sitchin was when um, Sitchin is very hard on sources. He's really hard to track down. He doesn't like footnoting things. But I was lucky in one sense because I was intrigued. Um, I, you know, I was looking for the best evidence. And one of the best evidences which he uses for his thing is is basically in the Sinai Desert, there is glass. And this glass does seem to suggest to be the result of exposure to extremely high heat. So his thing was that um, in his timeline, in his storyline, this glass was the result of nuclear warfare um, done by extraterrestrial beings. Well, for a number of books, this was just a standalone subject. And then he wrote a book which basically said that now scientists were agreeing with him uh, and that there had been uh, one report by a scientist which indeed said that he had explored all the possibilities to this glass and that it had to, that it was indeed of an unknown origin. So Sitchin was saying, well, you know, the scientist has explored all terrestrial possibilities. The unknown origin th- therefore has to be what I have been saying all along, which is that it is uh, E.T. Well, fortunately, um, if God is out there, he was helping me on this search because um, – Google is now such a fantastic tool, and this scientific publication was actually not protected by, you know, these scientific journals, firewalls, things. And it was freely accessible on the Internet, which is how Google found it. And so when I started doing my initial Google searches, it came up quickly, and I could identify uh, Sitchin's source, which I then was able to prove was indeed his source. In short, in the very abstract of this scientific paper, the person writing it, 
says that the glass is the result of a volcanic eruption. What he is unknown about is the fact that there were two or three potential volcanic eruptions, and he cannot identify which of these three volcanic eruptions specifically was responsible for the glass uh, in the Sinai Desert. You know, this is in the, in the abstract of the scientific paper. Sitchin is quoting from this abstract left, right, and center. And he either did not see the word volcanic eruption, in which case he needed a pair of, of reading glasses, or he specifically uh, intentionally distorted this, this scientific paper uh, to suit his own needs. You know, Mr. Sitchin is that, and uh, I, I will leave it at the fact that he's simply wrong um, as to how he is wrong. Um, you know, it doesn't matter that much, but basically he is wrong. Um, and the way his theories are built, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on, on, on whether you're a supporter or an opponent of him, basically... One, because his theories are so intricate and each bit of evidence built upon the other bit of evidence to arrive at an even bigger theory. Well, when you destroy some of the pieces of, of this buildup of evidence, this pyramid of evidence, uh, his entire theory comes to collect. I'll so the house, of say- cards, the house of cards therefore falls apart. Cherry yes. picking. Right. Yes. Now, I'll tell you what, you were going to start a longer answer and I interrupted you. I'm glad I did because it's nice to know your viewpoint about Sitchin. Okay, we have Philip Coppins. I'm Gene. He's Chris. You're in the Paracast. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs. Convert from so many formats, I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. This is Alex Jones with five good reasons you should consider buying a solar power generator. Number one, new climate legislation could easily double or triple your electric bill. Number two, our new energy czar wants to control how much power your electric company allows you to have. It's true. Total government control of electricity in the name of smart grid technology is coming. Number three, in some areas of the country, the power grid is dangerously overloaded. And now new socialist legislation is only compounding the problem. Number four. Dangerous weather is always a threat to local grids. Every year, thousands of families lose their power from weather-related outages. Number five, a solar power generator provides powerful backup insurance and peace of mind. Folks, I really believe in the solar power generators offered by Solutions from Science, one of my oldest sponsors. You can get more information at www.mysolarbackup.com. That's mysolarbackup.com. Remember, the government doesn't own the sun, so go to MySolarBackup.com or call 1-877-327-0365. Big Berkey water filters are in high demand. Storable foods are also in high demand. BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com has always kept our focus on the Berkey water filter products, but increasingly, our customers have been asking for storable foods. After months of research, BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com now offers great-tasting, long-lasting, storable foods. These ready-to-eat meals are packed in airtight nitrogen pouches. All you do is just add water. And because they're sealed so well, they come with a 25-year shelf life. Combine our Berkey water filters, which are powerful enough to purify treated, untreated, or even stagnant pond water with our storable foods, and you have a winning combination. Remember, we offer free shipping on every order over $50, and GCN listeners receive 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Visit Big B-E-R-K-E-Y waterfilters.com or call 877-99-BERKEY. That's Big Berkey waterfilters.com or call 877-99-BERKEY today. How would you like to have normal blood pressure? This is Ernesto from Illinois. I had my doctor's appointment yesterday and I got my labs in. 
My HDL is 119L, and my LDL is 37L. My doctor asked what I was doing to lower it so much, so I told her about HB Extract. Millions of people like Ernesto are suffering from high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, unbalanced cholesterol, irregular heartbeat, and clogged arteries. But now there's an effective, natural, 100% organic nutritional supplement for a healthy heart and circulation. Heart and Body Extract. My blood pressure has not gone past 125 over 80 in almost a month. Experience amazing benefits when your body gets what it needs with the assistance of Heart and Body Extract. She did a double take when she looked at my ER labs. She couldn't believe it. Order at HBExtract.com or call 866-295-5305. That's HBExtract.com or call 866-295-5305. Thank you. Heart and Body Extract. Hello, this is Rosemary Ellen Guiley, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. With Gene and Chris on the Paracast, we explore those ancient mysteries, and as you see with Philip Coppins, he doesn't accept everything out there. He's skeptical about various things for various reasons. So you started on a long answer. I interrupted you. How about picking up on the original question? What was the original question again? We were talking about uh, 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 evidence of uh, genetic tampering in the oh, human yes. genome. Oh, yes. So the short answer is no. However, uh, in recent months, Paul Davis of the Arizona State University has written a scientific paper in um, Acta Astronautica in which he's basically saying that we should start looking for evidence of alien life on this planet. Now, it is his conviction in this paper that this footprint, as he calls it, this alien footprint, uh, will not be found within the, and I quote again, human habitation um, on planet Earth. So he's basically saying that uh, E.T. might have been here, but that it happened millions of years ago, if not 800 of millions, if not billions of years ago. But I actually feel that um, Mr. Davis is... um, has been subjected to some kind of Sitchinite thinking as well. And in my most recent update on my own website, uh, there's actually discussion of, of Paul Davis's research. But he is proposing to science that we should indeed start to look at our DNA. And this is going to be a very big task. So basically, the SETI at Home project, which NASA did, he's su- suggesting that we're going to do the same thing with DNA so that somebody is, is basically going to um, create a software that in computer downtime, you know, we're also going to look at all of this evidence and help us find whether or not there is something within the genetic material, DNA or otherwise, which might show that we have been um, interfered with. Um, or as he is suggesting, uh, a so-called message in a bottle. Uh, And basically, he's suggesting that there might actually be something in our genetic record um, suggesting that, you know, it's like uh, E.T. has left a message in there, uh, which hopefully we could read. Now, Now, that also raises a bigger question, and I want to go into it before we go further. Why would E.T. embed that message it seems a strange way to communicate, although I guess I can't figure out alien logic. Would it also be fair to say, well, maybe we are part E.T. in a sense that we carry some of their genetic material? Well, as to why E.T. would do that, um, you know, you, you would need to, to address that with Mr. Davis. Or with um, E.T. Or with E.T. <laughs> or with both. You know, two interviews for, the, for, for one. Um, the, the one thing about the alien DNA thing, which I do in, in my book, is, is basically that the current consensus of science, astrobiologists specifically, is that more than likely life did originate not on this planet but outside in the universe. Um, and there are extraordinarily, and, and I relate them in the book, extraordinarily tales by the likes of Chandra Wickramashinghi, who's a professor of astro. Uh, biology at at the University of Cardiff, um, who's basically been saying that scientific journals since 1982 are involved in a conspiracy of silence, that they do not want to publish anything which shows, if not proves, that life does not originate on planet Earth, but originates out there in the universe. NASA is a victim of this, which is why NASA basically is now doing uh, science by press release. They are holding press conferences where they make these announcements because they know that they will not get published. Um, As extraordinary as that sounds, there are scientists out there who are um, saying that 
NASA is involved in a conspiracy whereby they are intent on making everybody believe that there is alien life and these skeptics are saying that there is no evidence whatsoever that life um, originates outside of this planet. And guess where they are referring to? To the fact that none of these NASA astrobiologists are being published in peer-reviewed journals. Well, you know, there is a reason for that. It is because these journals are not even um, putting out for review uh, the material which these scientists are, are putting forward. That raises another question here, which is Philip Coppin's opinion. Do you think E.T., even if they were there or here then, are here now in the form of UFOs. Oh, my God. How many times do I have? Um, (laughs) (laughs) Well, Gene, I think he's brought up a really good point that uh, I've been trying to make to people for years. When they say, you believe in aliens? I I say, well, wait a minute. How do you know we're not the aliens? So maybe maybe I'm right. You know, I I think UFOs... uh, by default, a UFO is, is an unidentified flying object. Um, you know, do I believe Roswell was a crash of ET? No. Um, do I believe that some of these things which um, are being reported like UFO abductions are real? Yes. Do I think they are physically real? Not necessarily. I think they show extraordinary parallels to um, you know, accounts of, of abductions by fairies, abductions by other uh, creatures. So do I think something is going on here? Yes. Do I think that some of these objects which are being photographed are real? Yes. Does it mean that it is intriguing? Absolutely. Should we, disc- should we um, analyze it further? Absolutely. Uh, can we jump to the conclusion that it is E.T.? At this moment in time, no. Yeah, you're my kind of guy, Philip. Okay, so basically he's really just buttering us up, that's all. He's doing a great job. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Well, I mean, there's always questions. I'm, I'm a walking question bank. I'm thinking uh, in terms of the forums. I think no, we, we just uh, we didn't give people enough questions. time to pose those questions. Now, considering other issues here, okay, so we have UFOs, we have the possibilities of abductions, which could have other purposes, but now we go back to the possibility of the ancient astronauts. So let's go to the physical reality here. Do you think at all that these indications of advanced technology did come from ET, and that? What about the biblical influence, Ezekiel's wheels, etc.? Did they see E.T. in those days and just interpret them in accordance with their level of civilization? Well, they, they definitely recorded something, and the, the, the story of Ezekiel is an interesting one, and I, I touch upon it in, in the book. Um, and it's because uh, of, of, you know, like Eric used it, Eric scoured the Bible um, for, for potential evidence. And again, you know, the Bible is a story of the Jewish people as they go about doing their business. And, and largely, it is the Jewish people who are pointing out that, in their opinion, reality is far more complex than an awful lot of people believe. And so whenever something anomalous happens to one of them, they are writing this down. And the story of Ezekiel is, is, is one such thing. It's the story about a, about a Jewish priest who's in exile in Babylonia and who basically, as we would call it today, is abducted by a UFO. Uh, He's taken to weird places. He sees strange things. Now, von Daniken was saying, you know, was he abducted by E.T.? And when Joseph Blumrick, who's an NASA engineer, reads this, he says, oh, I'm an NASA engineer. I'm going to quickly debunk this because I just know that this is simply impossible. And a few years later, he publishes a book called The Spaceship of Ezekiel, which basically says, actually, Ezekiel is giving in his description an enormous amount of of technical detail, which I have used to make drawings and um, scale models of of the object which Ezekiel has seen and which uh, took him away. Uh, The the story of of Jonah and the whale, well, you know, the whale had somehow got openings in his skin through which Jonah could see um, and he could see what was underneath the water um, and he could walk around inside the whale. It's, it's, you know, what I'm saying is is like this thing. Um, When the atomic bomb exploded, we described it as a giant mushroom. Now we know the atomic bomb explosion was not the explosion of some giant mushroom. We were describing it as a giant mushroom. And so the story of Jonah and the whale is very much the story of Jonah who says, I was in something which I know wasn't a whale because I was walking around it. There were windows. I could see. I could breathe. Four things which you can't do inside a whale. 
but he was describing the object because the nearest thing which his audience would understand was that it looked like a whale. Um, and so time and time again, you know, the Bible is, is, is just one example. Um, so it was but, one whale of a spaceship. Or an underwater construction. Or one whale <laughs> of a submarine. Uh-huh. Shades of the Nautilus. Shades of Jules Verne. You think about it. Our and you said my is, joke was corny. Well, I don't want to go into that because I will not deliver any more corny jokes. <laughs> Philip Coppins is wondering what the heck we're talking about. We're talking about lots of stuff with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. You expect professional service from your doctor, your accountant, and even the girl who takes your morning coffee order. Why not from your domain registrar, too? Namecheap.com provides stellar service with no sneaky upselling. We offer more features and security options for your website than there are ways to order a latte. And new domains come with WhoisGuard to protect your personal info. At Namecheap.com, you can get your domain for as low as $2.99. Now is a great time to get to know Namecheap.com. For 58 years, fate has provided true reports the strange and unknown fate brings you the latest in all aspects of the paranormal like angels and miracles psychic phenomena ghosts ufos and much much more to receive your complimentary fate magazine call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit their website at www.fatemag.com that's 1-800-728-2730 what are you waiting for your fate awaits Warning, this content is powerful and may cause others to reject your knowledge. If you want to know what happened to America, if you like cutting-edge information, if you need to convince someone that something different than what they believe is actually taking place, and to experience the true history of America you won't find anywhere else, get the new book, Satan's Show. Satan's Show is a hard-hitting look at what many know as the Antichrist and proof of a mind-control agenda. Learn how America was tricked into entering World War I and get over nine hours of audio and over 700 reliable web links. Satan's Show is available in ebook and audio downloads. Click the special offer for $14.99 and you'll receive both, plus Operation Northwoods on audio free with purchase. Download today at satanshow.com. You will be shocked. You will be amazed. Satanshow.com Why is it so many people suffer from so many illnesses today? Why don't doctors know how to help you? Could it be that our doctors don't know how because there's a nutrition solution and they only know about drugs? Over 68 diseases are connected to a deficiency of glutathione. The missing ingredient to increasing your body's production of glutathione is cysteine. Raising your glutathione production protects you from cancer, heart disease, Parkinson's, macular degeneration, lung disease, digestive diseases, diabetes, Alzheimer's, ALS, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus. Nature's richest source of cysteine is unheated whey. Heating can damage much of the cysteine. One World Whey is the first undamaged whey protein on the market. Using One World Whey may support optimal glutathione production unlike any other food or supplement you've ever taken. Call 888-988-3325. That's 888-988-3325. Or visit OneWorldWay.com. That's One World. W-H-E-Y dot com. If you owe money to the IRS, you can't make the problem go away by yourself. But with the help of Dan Pilla, you can get your problem solved once and for all. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla. For 30 years, I've helped thousands of people solve their tax debt problem, and I can help you solve yours, too. We take a very simple but proven three-step approach to solving your problem. First, we stabilize IRS collection actions so you don't have to worry about the IRS seizing your bank account or paycheck. Next, we build a comprehensive plan to get your tax debt reduced to the fullest extent possible, sometimes even completely eliminated. And finally, we work with you every step of the way to get your problem solved once and for all. Call us for a free consultation. Call 1-800-346-6829. We'll work together to get your problem solved guaranteed. Dan Pilla has been protecting taxpayers from the IRS for three decades, and he can help you too. Call us today at 800 800- 346-6829 that's 800 34 no tax 
Hi, this is Nick Pope. You're listening to the Paracast. It comes down to this with Philip Coppins exploring ancient mysteries with Gene and Chris on the Paracast. I guess we got to go to the pyramids. Okay. So science wants us to believe that we have this long-term project. The politicians said we're going to build it. It's going to take 50 years, 100 years, and we can sustain a project with peoples who maybe had lifetimes half what they are today. I'm one of those people who's very comfortable with saying that the ancient Egyptians built the pyramids. I'm also very happy with saying that, that humans build the pyramids um, within, you know, the time spans which which pretty much we um, believe. I'm not saying that I'm 100% happy with the timeline which Egyptologists are giving. Um, carbon dating evidence suggests that they are about 500 years out but, you know, that's a far cry off from saying that they are tens and if not hundreds of thousands of years old. The interesting thing when it comes to the pyramids is this. Um, Joseph Davidovich was an expert on the pyramids and he identified the pyramids as having been made with technology which we have only rediscovered in the 1970s. When he went to... Um, the likes of, of Sahi Hawass and his predecessors and pointed out that the stone blocks of the pyramids were not hewn and then dragged into place from the nearby quarries, but that instead they were geopolymers. People like Sahi Hawass said that he was an idiot and that the stone that the pyramid was not made from cement. Now a geopolymer is not cement. A geopolymer is basically natural rock except it's not natural. It's made in a laboratory. And it's very hard to distinguish from natural rock. Um, basically, uh, you can only tell by doing analysis of, of remnants of like, you know, like sh- seashells, which are splattered or about, which are not neatly lined up as they normally are um, in, 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 in uh, natural stone. And uh, Davidovich was showing roughly... 40 bits of evidence from the Giza Plateau, which to him was clear evidence that we were dealing here with geopolymers. Since then, uh, some of the analysis of of the Giza Plateau has been done in uh, uh, laboratories, and the conclusion is that indeed they are geopolymers, not natural stone. The way the Egyptologists are keeping this father of a science, because this is what he is, Davidovich is considered to be the, the father of the science of geopolymerization. They're trying to keep him out by saying he's an idiot. Now, again, this is bullying tactics, which they still get away with. Um, but it is also clear that the likes of Zahi Hawass have no understanding of what's going on. Um, because a geopolymer is not cement. Cement is cement, geopolymer is a geopolymer. And they don't understand and this is a, a serious problem. Um, and Davidovich, uh, unfortunately, is, is currently preoccupied with taking care of his sick wife. But there are other scientists out there who are taking up his, his cause and bringing it to the Egyptologists. Now, this is not evidence of um, E.T. building the Great Pyramid. What it is evidence of is of extraordinarily um, interesting technological capabilities which the ancient Egyptians had at their disposal and which pretty much for 4,000 years disappeared from planet Earth and were only rediscovered um, by, by the Vidovich in the, the, the mid-1970s. Now, that is something of interest. Now, we know from the ancient Egyptians who was considered to be the father of you know, geopolymerization, um, as we would call it now. That was Imhotep, high priest of um, Atom at Heliopolis, working for uh, King Zoser. He built- and understand, First- ladies and gentlemen, when we say Imhotep, he's not the character in the mummy movies. It's the real no, one. It's the other one. And basically, he was the guy who, you know, received this information because even though, like, you know, the question is, well, was he such a genius that, that he somehow figured this out? Well, yes, he was a genius, but he figured this not out on himself. He um, and everybody afterwards was quite clear that there was a divine connection with this, that he got this from 
non-human intelligence. And in the book, I make the uh, comparison that this is still going on. Uh, and and the, the best and shortest example is probably that of Terence McKenna. When he was using his ayahuasca, he said he made contact with a non-human intelligence. Um, and they gave him time wave zero, which these beings said is the nature of time. They said that time, as we understood it, was not a byproduct of some laws of physics, but was a fractal wave. Okay, that- so you're saying here, long and short of it, because we don't have a lot of time left, the long and short of it is taking this drug somehow gives you a direct route to communicate with these intelligences. It's not just an illusion or hallucination. That is precisely when it comes to ayahuasca, uh, what not just Terence McKenna, but various other people are saying. It's not a hallucinogenic drug as such. What this drug does is actually it stops something which our brain secretes constantly, and it interferes with this so that our brain um, basically is rid of this substance. And when our brain is rid of this substance, uh, our brain begins to see basically uh, uh, another dimension, another reality. And the interesting thing is, if it wasn't for this drug, our brain would constantly be literally outside of its brain, outside of its mind. There is biological things in our um, in our brains, or in our bodies rather, uh, which stops our brain from tricking, tripping constantly. And now, I do you think, think maybe here that answer. maybe some outside intelligence set things up this way with our genetic structure so we wouldn't be overwhelmed with these images? Well, it's a possibility. It's, um, it's actually something which um, I hope to explore two books down the line. Let's go dance with the machine elves. Hey, now that's a good question to bring it up to the conclusion. Philip, where do you go from here with your research? You've got another book coming out. Where are you going to take this? Well, basically, um, I'm hoping that this is going to be the start of a series of question books. Uh, the next one will be the lost civilization question, and uh, normally the one afterwards will be the afterlife question. Um, basically, they are um, all of them, beginning with the ancient alien question, um, books which basically map where we are on certain subjects. Um, what is what has validity? What can we safely toss aside? Where should we be focusing on? Um, what should we be trying to do? And to a large extent, unfortunately, you know, um, I will have to repeat myself and one of the repeating themes will be that science is simply uninterested and unwilling to do these things. Uh, but um, science, you know, science, science can't even define consciousness in a way that uh, is fully, fully real and acceptable. Even shows that they are conscious. Absolutely. And so, you know, what, what I'm trying to do is, is make uh, these big questions uh, hopefully accessible to uh, the larger audience out there. Um, and I hope I'm doing that with the Ancient Alien Question, and I hope I'm going to continue doing that with my next books. So if our listeners want to learn more of the things that you do, where do they go? Well, they can go to my own book, uh, sorry, to my own website, which is uh, philipcoppens.com. That is P-H-I-L-I-P-C-O-P-P-E-N-S. They can type my name in uh, on Twitter and they will come to me. They can type in my name to, into Facebook and they will come to me. They can go to Amazon and basically do a name search on me and they will find all of my um, books there. Um, they can go to Barnes & Noble. And they will find the ancient alien question hopefully prominently displayed there. If you can't find it, that actually means it's going to be sold out. Um, but it is part of. That's the pretty special. good. You hope it's going to be sold out. But then yeah, you're no, saying that's a good it, thing. Yeah, and you're saying that all roads lead to Philip Coppins. Basically, that's it. And again, in Barnes and Noble, there's a special promotion on the book, uh, which I believe actually does involve a discount. Obviously, Amazon does its normal discount, but I believe there's a special discount on that Barnes and Noble as well, um, up until about half. Um, uh, November and then at um, the, the, I think the 13th of December up until the 26th of December uh, there's another special promotion on at Barnes & Noble on the book uh, but at this moment in time I do not in- know whether it involves a discount I just know it's part of a special promotion Sounds great to me Chris O'Brien where do we find more of your stuff? Well I'm a moderator at forum.theparacast.com I'm in the midst of revamping my ourstrangeplanet.com website and, of course, you can hear me tell corny jokes and not talk about the trickster every Sunday. And, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, we can be found on Twitter. I never mentioned this. We are The Paracast. Look for The Paracast on Twitter, and you will find us. 
Special thank you from Gene and Chris to Philip Coppins. Philip, thanks for joining us this week on the Paracat. Thank you very much. And if there's one suggestion I would make, uh, your following guests, please have them vote on the corniest joke which the two of you come up with, and it'll be very <laughs> fun for the guests to do that. <laughs> That's a good idea. We try not to do too many. The Paracast, featuring Gene Steinberg and Christopher O'Brien, is a copyrighted presentation of Making the Impossible Incorporated. Tune in next week for a new adventure in The Paracast.